Much love and respect. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Thanks for all the support. This is part five or episode five of Genealogical Stories. In this episode, we will be taking a look at Nathaniel or Nat Turner's genealogy, his family tree, his actual bloodline. I know rumors are going around that he wasn't a real person. And I just want to make it clear that the point of this video is not to debunk that rumor, even though that will happen automatically. Once we see the true genealogy and, and see that he had actual living descendants, you cannot say all these people don't exist. Now, regarding the story of what he did and what happened on that day and the whole narrative of his confession, that's a whole other story. We'll talk about that a little bit, but we're going to be focusing on his actual family tree. Real history, real people, real records. Again, we're on part five. If it's not clear by now that when you do genealogy, it kind of debunks a lot of these uh, false, you know, slave or African stories. And this ain't no exception. I wanted to start out with this book right here. I bought it a while back on Amazon uh, Kindle. And it says here, Turner, descendants of the, their real name is the Chitting Haka, or what they're called as today, Nottoway Indians, right? This is by William A. Hinson. So again, the Turner descendants. So as soon as I saw that, and I had heard sign about him uh, possibly being, you know, Nottoway. So I bought the book. Just to see what I can find. Again, get familiar with Kata Shorrock Town in South Hampton County, Virginia. Again, South Hampton. Get familiar with all these places. We're going to be talking about these uh, locations a lot when it comes to Ned Turner's family and descendants. And here's an emblem or logo of the tribe. Just going to read the introduction here. We're just going to get familiar with uh, this tribe in case you guys are not familiar before we get to Ned Turner. Uh, this is the introduction of this book. It says here, History of the Chering Haka, Nottoway Indian Tribe, researched and compiled over many years by Chief Walt Red Hawk Brown of the Chering Haka, Nottoway Indian Tribe. Chief Walt Red Hawk Brown. Again, if you don't remember, just about a month ago, I uh, uploaded a video, an interview with Chief Walt Red Hawk Brown, letting us know about the paper genocide of his people being misclassified as colored and a lot of other things but that's who they're talking about in that book so he knows a lot of the history of his people and he was able to help out uh, with the research for this book that we're about to read and if you haven't seen the video make sure to check it out so listed here from the tribal website address all right you guys can see the website you like to check it out Southampton County in 1963, the story goes, the last of the Nottoway Indians died. Again, they always trying to say, you know, the last of your ancestors died, the last of the tribe, right? 
got to dodge the hijack. You still here? A fierce tribe of the Iroquois nation, fierce, had dwindled over 350 years to one old man, illiterate, who worked as a farmhand and rode a bicycle into town for beer. William Land is buried near the farm where he lived and worked on lands once granted to the Nottoway Indians by the Crown of England to be theirs forever. But the monarch overlooked one thing. The land already belonged to the Indians, had belonged to them for thousands of years since the ancestors of the clan mothers camped on Stony Creek. They were Indian lands before John Smith set up fort, before Pocahontas met John Rolfe, before the Tuscarora War and the American Revolution and the Civil War and Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924. And one more thing, William Land wasn't the last of the Nottoway. The blood that is thicker than Nottoway River water has summoned the descendants. They seek to recover a past that was, for so many years, denied them. They call themselves an Iroquois, Chering Haka, the people of the fork of the stream. They are scattered over at least seven states and Canada. They are coming home to Southampton County. But like any journey worth taking, I isn't easy. Francis Kello stood on the bluff of the old Indian reservation, his family's land now, looking down at the cypress tree, the elbow of smooth water in the bank where this son of Britain now stores his own canoe. You can see why the Indians would pick this site, Kello said. It's the most beautiful high spot on the Nottoway River. I imagine the Indian kids playing up and down the side of these hills like I used to. You can go up and down the river wherever you want and you won't find another place like this, which is why the Indians want to come back. They have been back four, five times since February and when the descendants of the Cheringhaka, pronounced Cheringhoka, held the first tribal meeting in Pelos River Cottage, they know they're Indians, but some are not exactly sure what that means. When colonial invader John Smith asked the Algonquin around Jamestown what tribe lived to the west, they replied, not away. In their language, the term meant snake or enemy. History as written by the English recorded that name. And today, Southampton County, the Nottoway River flows. Nottoway House sells furniture and the highway marker besides the high school says Nottoway Indians. Some descendants of the tribe who fled north to Canada and Wisconsin, who ended up in Missouri and Ohio and Rhode Island, who live in North Carolina, still use the name. Those who stay do not. They want state and federal recognition as the Chiringhoka. They want their ancestors' bones back from the Smithsonian Institution. They want to rebury them on Kello's land, on Sussex County's Stony Creek, a tributary of the Nottoway. Archaeologists have turned up Indian artifacts from at least 15,000 years ago. These first Americans were building fires and making arrowheads 6,000 years ago before anyone crossed the land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. All right. So now I just want to, uh, I just want to point out, and you know, this is history. You know, the Iroquois people originated in Canada and came down. They're not, they weren't there 15,000 years ago. That was a different people that was there. Eventually they made their way down to Virginia a long time ago. Yes, but not 15,000 years ago. Upsetting theories about the colonization of North America. These probable Nottoway ancestors moved on downstream near the present-day county seat of Cortland. All right, Cortland. What did the insurrection of Nat Turner, all this is going on? Southampton, Virginia, Cortland, right? All these places, right? While looking for surface arrowheads in the early 1960s, Russell Darden found that looters had been digging for Indian artifacts on the riverbank. A founder of the Nottoway chapter of the Archaeological Society of Virginia Darden contacted authorities, raised money for a professional excavation, and took an active role in examining what came to be called the hand site. We have them dated here in the 1500s, Darden said, and that's pretty definite a Nottoway village because of the house construction. The archaeologists uncovered the remains of 136 Indians and one so-called white woman, maybe a Spaniard, <laughs> maybe a lost colonist, so hold up now you guys you guys seen my videos right not so uh english colony right who were these so-called english sephardic 
Moorish people, crypto Jews, crypto Muslims. So he's saying this so-called white woman, she might be actually Spaniard. Who's the Spanish? Maybe a lost colonist, right? Maybe from the Roanoke lost colony. Remember, they survived. They stayed amongst the Indians. They never was lost. Most of the Indian bones ended up in the Smithsonian, where they will stay unless the Nodaway can. Indeed, gain recognition as a tribe and apply for their ancestors' repatriation. For now, in the eyes of the government, no descendants remain to claim them. The English colonists arrived in 1607, but they didn't meet the Nodaway until 1650, when merchant Edward Bland came upon a village of some 400 people. Their distance from Jamestown, about 40 miles, limited contact with the English. Still, the Nodaway, along with several other tribes, signed a peace treaty in 1677, which called for a yearly tribute to the governor. After the Tuscarora of North Carolina lost their war against so-called white settlers or Europeans in 1713, some of the Nodaway joined the Iroquois cousins in a great migration back to the vicinity of New York. Those who remained in Virginia were met in 1728 by William Byrd, all right? And that's the tale we got from Chief Red Hawk Brown. And we got a primary source from William Byrd. He described the Shedding Hakka people. We're going to get that again today. So William Byrd found them living around a palisaded fort on what is now Kello's farm. The young men had painted themselves in a hideous manner, right? So this is part of the book right here where he's describing the young men. You know, they had this uh, tribal warfare paint on. They were making this noise and the drums were going off. They were forced to be messing with. So the young men had painted themselves in a hideous manner, Bird wrote, while the ladies had arrayed themselves in all their finery. They were wrapped in their red and blue mesh coats, thrown so negligently about them that their mahogany skins appeared in several parts. Mahogany skins, okay? Bird speculated that their dark skin would breed out in two generations, all right? He wrote this. The Nodaway lived in longhouses, made light-colored clay pottery, and weapons of rock that came from as far away as Ohio. Their homeland is now plowed for cotton planting, and Kello's family collects tobacco pipes and grinding stones after a rain. An avid historian, he is sympathetic to the descendants' search for their roots, was here one day after I had just been plowed and the sun was just right. I tanned, I could see the post holes where the longhouse was, he said. I never seen it before, and I never seen it since. But he was beautiful that day. The English thought the Indian men should be farmers. The Indians thought farming was women's work. They preferred hunting and fishing. And as English settlers closed in around their lands, that became harder to do. In 1714, Aura Coras Terhir of the Nodaway signed another treaty, this one between only one tribe and the crown. The treaty promised the tribe be protected reservation in exchange for yearly tribute, the learning of Christianity, and a warning of any other tribe's plan attack on European settlers, okay? You see the treaty stipulation? You had to snitch, and you had to accept Christianity. Hmm, why are you making treaties like that? They were given two pieces of land, one described as a circle with a radius of three miles on the north side of the Nodaway River, the other parcel was a square, six miles on every side, south of the river. Here the Nodaway retreated, and here they found the going rough. Today the river water is as much as 20 feet deep in some particularly good fishing spots. The remnants of an Indian fish weir are still there, largely hidden below the surface. The cypress trees that line the riverbank are estimated at a thousand years old, far older than the reservation. They grow so slow, Kello said. It's a shame almost to cut a cypress tree. You wonder how much longer those old cypress trees will stand. Land-hungry Englishmen wondered that about the Nodaway too. Unused to farming, trapped by death and beguiled by alcohol, the Indians began asking the General Assembly for permission to sell or lease parts of the reservation, all right? Tapped by debt. We're going to read how they were being, you know, tricked into getting into these debts 
for beer or alcohol. You know, they would let them owe them, you know, money, and then they would come collect it later on and then take their land for it. A 1747 document records the sale of 100 acres for only 30 shillings. It is signed by eight Indians, all of whom used anglicized names. We know Robin, Sam, Dr. Tom, John Turner, again, John Turner, Winnowick Arthur, Tom Turner, Roger, and Colonel Frank. By 1784, Thomas Jefferson wrote in his notes of the state of Virginia, of the Nottoways, not a male is left. A few women constitute the remains of that tribe. 1784, what happened to all the males? These were fierce young men. What happened to them? Only the women remain, huh? We're going to see who was the chief and who's related to Nat Turner. And she was a woman. Okay? So only women left. It matches why she was the chief. Only women left, huh? 1784. When was he born? 1800s. They have usually had trustees appointed. So they had these people appointed to them, these women that were left whose duty was to watch over their interests and guard them from insult and injury, okay? Remember that. Around 1792, John Thomas Blow bought the central part of the Square Reservation. In 1805, his son built Rose Hill, a stately two-story White House that still stands. The property was sold after the Civil War to the Kello family, some member of which has lived there ever since. The Kellos own more than 1,000 acres of former reservation. How could they own their land like that, huh? Yeah, Kello said. Everything around here is Indian. The route to Rose Hill goes up Medicine Springs Road to Indian Town Road, which traces the old Indian trail along the edge of Asamosic Swamp. Kello wore a scrimshaw belt buckle of a three-masted ship under full sail, the kind of ship his ancestors came on in 1741. You see where that culvert is, he asked, from the front seat of a Jeep, Cherokee. That's where William Lamb's house was. Up the tractor-rooted road, he went, past the White House and the cemeteries for the blows, the kellows and the slaves, just to the right in that pine woods. That's where the old Indian graveyard was, Kello said, 65, 70 years ago. When I used to play through there, you could tell where the graves were. Lamb worked for Kello's mother, married to a so-called black woman, king to the Indians, a black, so-called black woman who was actually related, right? Who was family to the Indians. So if she's related to the Indians, what does that make her? Black is a crayon color, dodged the hijack. Now, remember, they're telling you all this was Indian. Everything around here is Indian, he said, right? Everything around here is Indian. So when you're talking about later on, there's all of a sudden plantations on these places and all of a sudden there's slaves. You think it was Africans? Remember, they didn't need to go to Africa. They had local people here. They enslaved and they had their indentured servants. They were sending over here hundreds of thousands of them. Let's not forget all the previous research but again everything around here is indian and this so-called black woman is king to the indians he was buried in a churchyard not far away the kello family has reunions in the small cinder block river cottage every year around easter its members come back to the old homestead look for arrowheads and pottery kello has put many of his artifacts in the county museum so no one will forget the Indians. Would kind of hate to see them, he paused for reflection. Well, in one sense of the word, they have disappeared. The Nottoway tried but could not resist. The encroachment of the English and marriage to other races, dodged the hijack, unable or unwilling to farm the land, they sold more and more of it. An 1808 census of the tribe named 17 persons 1808 census is very important because it contains Nat Turner's family. Yes, the census of the Nottoway Indians. It has Tom Turner, 36 years. 
It reads, he has left his farm in the possession of a mulatto woman. <laughs> what does that mean? Who has been kept by him as a wife. All right. An Indian, the greater part of his time has been generally spent in drunkenness and the destruction of what little crop he has made. He is the only Indian in his family. Oh, he's an Indian too with a mulatto woman, right? That he kept at his wife, another Indian. So Tom Turner, right? Turner. Then we got Littleton Scholar, 51 years, right? He is the only Indian in his family. His wife being a white woman, dodged a hijack. You mean a European? Could it be another of the Spaniards? Lost colony? The bloodlines were starting to separate. In 1821, some of the more industrious not away made a faithful request to the General Assembly, divide the reservation, land held in common for the tribe, into individual allotments. The legislators twice rejected the request, but in 1824 they agreed. Some Indians immediately sold their land. Others refused even to ask for it until 50 years later. The Indians who had moved north with their Tuscarora cousins had been assimilated into the other tribes, becoming the Sixth Nation of the Iroquois Confederation, now known as Six Nations of the Grand River Reservation near Branford, Canada. The Indians in Southampton County were absorbed into the so-called black or so-called white communities, into the crayon colored communities, guys. <laughs> so they got absorbed into the so-called black community, huh? All right. Do I need to say any more? Who's that Turner? Do I need to say any more? Those who still remember their Nottaway heritage then encountered Walter Ashby Plecker. What did Plecker do? Remember, guys? Paper genocide. As Virginia's first register of the Bureau of Vital Statistics, Plecker was an outspoken supporter of the Racial Integrity Act of 1924. The act created two racial categories, white and everyone else. Plecker, also a proponent of eugenics, routinely changed the race on birth, death, and marriage certificates from Indian to Negro. All right? They changed the birth records from Indian to Negro. Get the drop. We've done the videos on that. Keep in handy a list of Native American surnames. He knew who you were. He knew who the families were that were Indians. Plecker tried to reclassify every Indian in Virginia until his retirement in 1946. Again, he tried to what? He, re he did reclassify every Indian in Virginia. They reclassified you. Facing segregation and prejudice, Indian descendants began hiding their bloodlines from their children. You hear that? Calvin Hall of Winston, North Carolina, chief of the Maharan Indian tribe, said that when he was eight years old in the 1940s, he ran from home from school to tell his grandmother about his lesson on pilgrims and Indians. She said, we're all Indians, but we can't talk about it. We didn't talk about it. All right. And many people know about this history and situation with their ancestors having to hide their Indian ancestry. Shout out to Anu for the stories he told me. The act was struck down in 1967 by the U.S. Supreme Court, but the damage was done. Generations had grown up believing they were either black or white. The damage was already done. It has been done. There's people out here still trying to debate. And they call themselves crayon colors, right? They grow up believing they were either black or white. Crayon colors and official documents confirm that. So they look at it, it says black. They're like, oh, I am black. Yeah, they reclassified you. Nobody is black or white. Those are crayon colors. Those who held on to their Indian identity paid a different price. Norbert Johnson's father was placed in an orphanage in the 1930s because his mother was teaching him drumming and dance. The community thought it was an uprising or something. Johnson said from his St. Louis home, there were a lot of people placed in orphanages or sent to different Christian homes. It was to eliminate the savage in them. So you see what they did to the children? Johnson grew up to join the military, begin genealogical research, and now, after retirement, to spend 80% of his time working on Native American issues, including the return and recognition of the Nottoway. A lot of people think this is really cool, he said. 
but a number of years ago when it wasn't fashionable to be Native American, I was Native American. Johnson is helping the Nottoway Confederation, a loose affiliation of the descendants in North Carolina, Wisconsin, Ohio, and other states seek a legal clarification from Virginia's Attorney General on the tribe's status. The number one thing to do is restore the Nottoway in Virginia, Johnson said. The Nottoway who are there, the ones who stayed behind, have a right for the reclamation of their heritage. The people are being called for some reason to call each other without knowing our history, our genetic ties. If you understand anything within the spiritual world, it's a gathering. We've most definitely changed our shapes, but there's a desire to return, Johnson spoke, of buying back tribal lands, of setting up health clinics for Native Americans or returning the Nottoway culture to Southampton County, right? American Indians. To gain state and federal recognition as the Sheridan Hoka Nottoway, the descendants of Virginia will have to document Indian blood, a task complicated by Plecker's erasure of their past. They must search for key surnames, notations of colored, mulatto, or even Portuguese, all right? So where you see colored, mulatto, all right, and por or even Portuguese, in a lot of those cases, it means Indian. So if we see that today, remember that, guys, where we see colored, mulatto, or even Portuguese, and birth certificates, marriage licenses, deeds, jail records, wills, and other documents. We are descendants, Johnson said. We all have a right to reclaim that that was once part of our history. Some were classified as white or black. Those who remained behind were called colored. Some were classified as white or black. The ones who stayed were called colored, so-called Negro. And then eventually what? African-American. That creates the issue of who are they? Legally, morally, culturally, who are they? Diane Tennant, Turner, descendants of the Sherenghoka, Nottoway Indians. Henry Turner, Generation One. Says he was born in Brindle Carmel Lang, Cashire, England. He died in Chuntertow, Surrey County, in Virginia. He married an unknown Sherenghoka Indian in Chilton Road Town, Surrey County. All right, so they're saying this guy, Henry Turner, brought the surname Turner with him and married an Indian woman. Notes for Henry Turner Sr., history of the Jordan Hawk and Nottoway Indian tribe, researched and compiled over many years by Chief Walt Red Hawk Brown of the Jordan Hawk Nottoway Indian tribe. Okay, so they know who he is. So, couple pages ahead uh, is telling us the full blood Sharon Haka Nadawa Indian and Henry Turner right had the following children and Turner uh, another son was James Turner then we got Love Turner a daughter and we got Virginia Turner and then we got Thomas Turner because Thomas Turner was the servant of Captain Daniel Park of George County on October 26, 1657, when the court ordered him to open penance at the next public meeting of St. Martin Church because it appeared by the report of a Negro woman as well as by circumstantial evidence that he was the father of her child. I think Negro, so-called Negro woman, huh? Thomas Turner, who's an Indian, right? Turner, who's half black European, half Indian. But then we got another Henry Turner, or so Jr., so there's a Henry Turner Jr. All right, so now it keeps recording the genealogy of a lot of these Turners in this book. And before we continue in the book, we're going to come back to this a little later on. We're going to start matching all these names with the tree. So I want to do it at the same time because you guys probably won't remember and see the connection. But we'll come back to this. Just wanted you guys to see that this book is real. The research has been done to verify this, who these people are. And now we're going to see all these names and his genealogy. So that was just a little brief history of the sharing Hoka people tribe and its relationship to the Turner family. Just wanted you guys to see that there are actually known Turners that are sharing Hoka or Nottoway Indians. And that this is all happening in the same area. 
with this Nat Turner rebellion took place. And he happens to be associated with the people mentioned in that book. Now I'm going to show you guys the relationship he has to these people. Before I do that, I just want to make it very clear in case anybody uh, knows the family or the family is watching, you know, living relatives. Just know I come with all respect. This is to uh, let people know the true history and genealogy. We were told the false narratives. And I hope you see this of more as a help to everyone than me intruding into private things. Now, before everybody starts leaving the comments and I posting the Wikipedia links and the generalized mainstream information about Nat Turner to try to debunk me, we're going to read over this information, what they teach in schools. And this is the Britannica.com website uh, online. Just want to show an example, okay, guys? So it says here he was born in Southampton County, Virginia. That's where we're going to be, you know, Jerusalem, as it was called, the so-called Black American slave who led an effective, sustained slave rebellion. Down here it says Turner was born the property of a prosperous small plantation owner in a remote area of Virginia. His mother was an African native who transmitted a passionate hatred of slavery to her son. Oh, really? All right, guys, where's the sources? You guys see there's no footnotes, nothing to go verify. She's not an African. We're going to see the whole genealogy. We're going to see if anything pops up that says that she was African. So you got to dodge the hijack, and that's why I'm trying to show you this first right away. We're going to address these lies first. You know, this is the rest of the story. So as you guys can see, there's actually no sources for any of the stuff in here. You're supposed to just believe what they're saying. This is Britannica, right? We're going to Wikipedia. This is what most people, you know, go off. Now, it says here in Turner's life, he was an enslaved African-American, dodged the hijack. That word phrase didn't even exist when he was uh, uh, growing up in, in his town. Teacher who organized and led the four-day rebellion of enslaved free black people. As Turner was born into slavery in Southampton County, an area with more black people than white. All right. Hmm. That's deep right there because they are telling the truth right there. But don't think the so-called black people are only the slaves. That's where you got to dodge the hijack. Those who've been following me for a while know where I'm going with this. If you're new, just sit back. I'm going to show you. Turner knew little about the background of his father, who was believed to have escaped from slavery when Turner was a child. Believed to be. All right? He knew little about his father, so they don't know anything, huh? They don't know anything about his father, right? This is what they tell us. Now it's believed to have escaped. And who told you that? Where are they getting this all this stuff from? Now, before we continue, you know, I want to go ahead and show you where everybody's getting their whole story and source from that Nat Turner did this and he said what he said. All right. Now, I just want to point something out right away. We're going to read the title. It says, The Confessions of Nat Turner, the leader of the late insurrection in Southampton, Virginia, as fully and voluntarily made to Thomas R. Gray in the prison where he was confined and acknowledged by him to be such when read before the court of Southampton with the certificate under seal. So they're like, hey, this is authentic. He told us this. So we are to trust a so-called lawyer that supposedly got his confession in 1831. Uh, real quick, I'm in the website, theroot.com. Uh, they have an article here that says, Am I related to Nat Turner by Henry Louis Gates Jr. and NEHGS Research Megan Sigmund, Christian Britannic. All right, so you guys already know who Henry Louis Gates is, right? This here, recently I was told that my grandmother's family line was linked to Nat Turner. I have done some research, but I'm unable to get beyond my great-great-grandmother. Gertrude Turner in Virginia. I just wanted to know if the Turner family has done a family tree and where Gertrude Turner is on it. I know Gertrude married Curry in Virginia in the late 1800s. Thank you for any assistance, Cassandra Eccles. Now, I just want to point out, you know, there's many descendants of Turner. You know, they're saying, hey, you know, I'm a descendant. My grandma told me, you know, it's just hard for them to kind of get the link because of what they did and the stories they created. But 
My point is, you cannot say these people are not real. You can't say these people don't exist. These are real people, real descendants of Nathaniel Turner. Yeah, a.k.a. Nat. Says here, although Turner is a well-known figure in African-American history, even though he's such a popular character, right? The details of his personal life and family history are much less clear. They don't really know or they're not telling us. Among historians, there is disagreement about the marriage of Turner and any children born out of that marriage. It is believed that Turner had a wife, but her name and how many children they had are widely disputed. Again, this is all by design. It's on purpose. They do not want you to follow up the descendants because it will show who he is and who his people are and where they were living. I'm going to show you guys. Some accounts show that they had at least one son named Redrick. All right, remember that name, Redrick or Riddick? While others state that they had more than one child. And yes, they did. One of the earliest written accounts of the Turner Rebellion published in a newspaper states that his wife, who was owned by a man named Mr. Reese, all right, received a severe punishment for her husband's actions. So we're going to see that Nat Turner's wife uh, seems to be a lady named by uh, Cherry or Chari Creasy. Uh, Reese has that last name. Reese and Stilt. So is this Mr. Reese possibly her father instead of a so-called white slave master? Now, regarding that book I told you was written in 1831, his supposed confession, it says here, the Confessions of Nat Turner is a document that was frequently used in the past to study Turner's life and family. This is the one source they've been using, guys. Thomas Gray, a Virginia lawyer, crafted this document based on jail cell interviews with Turner following his capture months after the insurrection. It is important to note that because the document itself was not in Turner's own words, these are not in his own words, the accuracy of his confession is called into question. So we're supposed to believe the very same people that murdered him, right? That he was trying to get rid of for some reason. I have in fact noted in the past that we have a very fragmented, disjointed narrative which purports to be the confessions and there is the question of whose voice is there. All right, that was Thomas Gray and his goons who wrote that. In the years after the rebellion, many attempts were made by writers and historians to find out exactly who Turner was, with each effort mentioning various alleged family members. In 1955, Lucy Mae Turner, a poet born in Sainsville, Ohio, published an article titled The Family of Nat Turner, 1831-1954, which details the life and struggle of the Turner family after his execution. The narrative is centered on Turner's purported son, Gilbert, and a woman named Fanny was called Turner's wife. All right, so what we're going to show, there is a Fanny involved in the line of Nat Turner. I'll show you who Fanny was. The author Lucy Turner claimed to be the granddaughter of Nat Turner and the daughter of Gilbert. While it is true that Lucy was Gilbert's daughter, if one looks at Gilbert's death certificate, now pay attention, as reported by Lucy herself, one sees that his parents were listed as John Turner of Virginia and Mary Moore of North Carolina. It also shows that he was born circa 1834, well after the death of Nat Turner. Although there can be errors in vital records, this does not support the claim that Lucy Turner was the granddaughter of Nat Turner. Now, it doesn't say that she might not be related to him, okay? It's just the stories get mixed up. She still might be related. There's a lot of Turners in the same area. They're all family. I'm going to show you guys. The fact that little is known about the family, such a prominent figure in history, highlights some of the biggest challenges in researching so-called African-American genealogy before the Civil War. Uh, before they start doing their reconstruction and adding all their hijacks huh, and reclassifying you. I just want to read that uh, real quick. All right. Again, this source they've been using all our lives to tell us the Nat Turner Rebellion story and his supposed confession was written by somebody else. It wasn't even written by Nat Turner. And we're supposed to believe and trust that he said all this. But you guys are going to see when we do the genealogy, that there's a whole different story here and it's not making sense. And when you see the relationship of Nat Turner to the other Turners, including the ones we read about in that book of the Nottoway Indians, you're going to see this don't make sense. 
So I will say this. Yes, this story seems to be false. Something else happened. What happened is what we're trying to find out. But this specific whole slave narrative, rebellion, and people murdering so-called white people going on a rampage. I know others made videos about Nat Turner and told you, you know, showing you, you know, this story is false. And I agree with that part. But Nat Turner was real. And he had a lot of indigenous blood. I'm going to show you guys. So dodge your own hijacks, especially when you're following others and just believing blindly without doing your own research and without doing the actual genealogy. So going back to Wikipedia, now remember that they were saying Turner knew little about the background of his father who had who was believed to have escaped from slavery. So he didn't meet him, supposedly, right? Where are they getting this? What is the source for that? It says here, Nat Turner, Slave Rebellion in History and Memory by Kenneth Greenberg. Let's go check that out. It says page 18. And again, we're here. It says here, Nat Turner, Slave Rebellion in History and Memory by Kenneth Greenberg. Let's go to page 18. Again, page 18. All right, we go down to where they're talking about his father. And then he says, but it is also important to recognize that we must be very careful to consider all the facts before we actually conclude that Nat Turner was the son of his master. James McGee has opened a line of thinking that we must consider seriously. And they mean that Benjamin Turner's is that. However, there are many ways to read the sources, both the written and oral ones. After all, in the confessions, Nat Turner does tell us twice. Through the pen of Thomas Gray, all right, he's letting you know who Thomas Gray wrote that, not Nat Turner, that his father was a slave. When Turner was a child, both his mother and his father encouraged him to believe that he was intended for some great purpose. All right, what parents don't tell their kids that, you know, all parents should do that. <laughs> Later, we learned that Turner's father escaped from slavery to some other part of the country. And they have a footnote, right, 44. And again, when you go see a uh, 44 footnote is literally confessions by Thomas Gray. That's, again, the one source they've been using for everything. You see how it went back to that same book? I just wanted to show you guys that. That's the only source they've been going on. Somebody else's account that we have to believe. Now, before I leave this book, I wanted to show you guys something I, I found when I was reading here. And I just want to show you. This is on page 14. It says here, the closest we can come to knowing what Nat Turner might have looked like would be to examine a reward notice issued by Virginia Governor John Floyd. During the 70 days that Nat Turner eluded capture, he was pursued by so-called white Virginians, remember free whites include Morse, in one of the most massive manhunts in the history of the state. The governor desperately wanted to catch the notorious rebel, and so he requested a detailed description by residents, they asked the people of Southampton County who knew him well. All right, pay close attention. William C. Parker responded with a written sketch of the man. He is between 30 and 35 years old, five feet six or eight inches high, weighs between 150 and 160 pounds, rather bright complexion, but not a mulatto. Again, he's rather what? Rather bright complexion, I mean, he's light skinned. Rather bright complexion, but not a mulatto, but he ain't mixed. He's just light-skinned. Broad-shouldered, large flat nose, large eyes, broad flat feet, rather knock kneed Walk brisk and active, hair on the top of the head, very thin, no beard except on the upper lip and the tip of the chin. A scar on one of his temples produced by the kick of a mule. Also one on the back of his neck by a bite. A large knot on one of the bones of his right arm near the wrist produced by a blow. Again, primary source describing him as bright, bright complexioned. Got to understand that they wanted to make sure they got a detailed description of him. And I'm going to show you what he says here happens after. The reward notice also raises the issue of Nat Turner's skin color. It tells us that Turner had a rather bright complexion, but that he was not mulatto. It is difficult to know the precise meaning of such a description. Clearly, in 1831 in Virginia, skin color was of vital importance. It was a central way of distinguishing so-called African Americans from so-called white people, as well as from each other. Hence, it served as a key part 
of a description that would be used to capture a fugitive. Like, wouldn't it be easy to distinguish, right? But again, they had to try to distinguish from each other, meaning they possibly look the same. Now listen to this part. It says, the portion of Nat Turner's description regarding his skin color has had an interesting history since Governor Floyd first issued his reward notice. Almost as soon as Floyd described Nat Turner as bright, there emerged powerful social forces working to darken his color. It happened almost immediately as soon as Nat Turner was captured. Now I'm not saying he was so-called white guys. I'm just saying he was a little lighter than they want us to think he was. Because they didn't want him to look like them. There's a lot of so-called black Europeans that were light-skinned. I just thought that was interesting for you to know in case you didn't know. Yeah, he was described as a light complexion. I want to talk about this book now, which is literally almost the same title as the other, or the original, uh, The Confessions of Nat Turner. Now, this is written by William Styron in the 60s. This is another source people try to use. And this one has a whole other twist that he was doing it because he had some relationship with a so-called white woman. So he twisted up the whole story even more. And again, look at the cover. It says a novel, a novel. I'm back on the Wikipedia page, go, going into some of the sources here. One of the sources is that book I just showed you, The Confessions of Ned Turner. You see, this is, this is a source they're using, right? Look what it tells you here, though. A novel by William Styron won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Fiction. Do you guys know what fiction means? I'm in the website VanityFair.com. It says here, the literary battle for Nat Turner's legacy. It says here in his 1967 novel, The Confessions of Nat Turner, William Styron, a white Southerner told the story of America's bloodiest slave revolt in the voice of its African-American leader, Ashta Hijack. Half a century later, Turner is the subject of Nate Parker's new film, The Birth of a Nation, and the literary battle Styron ignites is still raging. All right. All right. That's the hijack with all this. That's the hijack with all these actors and gatekeepers. All right. So this is the book we just saw. Again, the same book, right? But down here it says, The following January, the Styrons were invited to Washington for Johnson's inauguration. No Sherman Jack and Jackie at this time. Only drunk Texans and big hats. While Styron was getting dressed in the White House, his publisher, Bennett Cerf, called breathlessly to say the mass market publisher, New American Library, had offered $100,000 for the book. Even though the novel was less than a third finish, subsidiary deals were already being made that would eventually bring him a million dollars. But Styron didn't rush. My tortoise like art, as he called it, had to proceed at its deliberate pace. Once he reached the climatic scenes of violence, however, the pages came quickly. By January 1967, Styron's fictional account, fictional account, again, fictional account, do you guys know what that means? Fictional account of the first great African-American uprising was completed. Again, fictional account. It has taken four and a half years during which nonviolent protests had given way to blood in the streets. Something I also thought was funny, right? <laughs> we got another uh, guy writing fictional stories, right? We know about. We're talking about Alex Haley, right? With the movie Roots. He made that all up. So right here is funny that he's actually praising uh, this author for this book, right? Hey, it says, and the African-American author and journalist Alex Haley, excited by reading a newspaper interview with Styron, sent along these words of fellowship and gratitude. I don't know if I ever seen captured so succinctly what I too feel are the essences of our ethnic condition and the true motivations of the social tragedies recently. All right. In other words, thanks for helping me tell the lie even more and legitimizing what I did, which was to plagiarize a fictional book and create a fake movie. All right. So I just wanted to go ahead and point all this out. These two sources have nothing to do with the actual Nat Turner. So you got to empty your cup. What they told you in school, what they keep telling you in these movies and everything. You got to stop believing all that. We're going to get into some real history and real genealogy. All right, so we're going to continue. I want to uh, read uh, from this edition of Jet Magazine. This is from 1969, December 18, to be exact, uh, 1969. 
This is the cover right here. We got Muhammad Ali's debut in Broadway musical, huh? <laughs> Actually, a lot of pretty cool, interesting articles in these uh, magazines from the 60s kind of exposing a lot of things without them actually, I think, realizing what they're doing back then. Um, so we might get into some of these articles in these magazines for future videos. So I'm on page 14. It says here, Nat Turner's heirs seek share of movie millions. Heirs. Oh, I thought he was fake, though. All right? He had heirs, guys. Many of them. It says here, White's trying to buy all sites by Peter Bailey. Southampton County, Virginia, running to the North Carolina border, 68% black and still, same as in 1831. Depending on an agrarian, mostly peanut economy, should be one of the most sacred spots in the country for black people. It is the home of legendary revolutionary Nat Turner, who fed up with the oppression of slavery, launched on August 21st, 1831, a slave revolt that eventually killed 60 whites and shattered forever the always fragile stability of Southampton County, Virginia, and the South. All right, so, again, the whole story, right? You know, we got Dutch the Hijack. Again, where did they get it from? That one confession, supposedly, by Thomas Gray, the lawyer who wrote it. We're supposed to believe him. A little more down, it says, now there are so-called black people living in Southampton County who claim to be direct descendants of Nat Turner. Direct descendants. You think this just claims these people know their ancestors? One such family is the William E. Hicks family of Franklin, Virginia, where Hicks is the public housing project manager and relocation supervisor for the Franklin Redevelopment and Housing Authority. He says he is a great great grandson, basing his claim on a 1932 newspaper clipping found in the Bible of a grandmother who died at age 108. All right, this is all that's left over sometimes. These little newspaper clicks in the family Bible. But it's so hard to link it, right, with real records, especially when there wasn't no internet, computers. You had to go to the places yourself and go through the archives on your own. Hicks says that the article listed his family and several others as direct descendants. Where the writer of the news got his information is still a mystery. Like many black Americans, the Hicks and other black families of Southampton County they didn't realize until recently the value of their family tree. What finally arose such curiosity is the fact that Fieldham's 20th Century Fox Corp selected Southampton County as the location site for the movie it is doing on the life of Nat Turner. Blacks and whites are aware that the movie company is planning a $4 million budget for the film and that a predicted 1.7 million will be spent in Southampton County. Black residents insist that some of this movie flowed into the black community, and they are currently negotiating with 20th Century Fox on three key points. First, that the selection of film sites include property owned by black people, several key locations, including the cave where Nat Turner is supposed to have been captured, and another old house where, where whites were killed, are located on land owned by blacks, all right, so not just black, but the actual descendants, they still own it. Second, that black contractors and carpenters be used in building the replica of the city of Jerusalem. And finally, that Southampton blacks be employed as extras in the film. All right, so they're like, hey, you guys want to come make a movie here about our ancestor? These are the stipulations. When you continue, now we got a picture here. It says Joe Hicks, seated, who says he's Turner's great-grandson, is shown with... From left to right, Ashby Turner, who owns the land where Cave is, all right? That's a, a real descendant of him. These are real people, all right? This is not an act of Congress creating these people. I just want you guys to really understand that. It says Lloyd Richard and William E. Hicks, all right? So these are the people, and these are his actual descendants, all right? So I just wanted to show that real quick. Examples of living descendants. We already read about a couple, right? There's more. And you're going to see a lot of these people end up on the tree. Again, I just want to emphasize, and as stated by Princeton University Press, and even a book they wrote, says in the matter of Nat Turner, a speculative history by Christopher Tomlins, as he says, much about Turner remains unknown. They don't know anything. His extraordinary account of his life and rebellion, given in change, 
as he awaited trial in jail, was written down by an opportunistic white attorney and sold as a pamphlet to cash in on Turner's notoriety. But the enigmatic rebel leader had an immediate and broad impact on the American South, and his rebellion remains one of the most momentous episodes in American history. All right, again, do you see what he said? An opportunistic, he just did it to make money. Again, that was his account, Thomas Gray. Nat Turner didn't write that confession. So again, that confession doesn't state anything about his wife or his family or his children. They left that out conveniently. And there's a reason for that. And unless you are part of the family, then you wouldn't know he had descendants. Just here in the Virginian pilot, it's been 190 years since Nat Turner's rebellion. Brutal mysteries remain unsolved by Ben Swenson. Basically, they talk about after his death, his body was mutilated and stuff. And then there's a whole history about his skull and how eventually the family wanted it back. Uh, it says here in 2002, a former mayor of Gary named Richard H. Hatcher held a fundraising gala for a project he hoped to usher to fruition the National Civil Rights Hall of Fame. That night, he unveiled what would be the museum's centerpiece, the skull of Nat Turner. The chain of custody seemed plausible. Hatcher had received this call from two Indiana civil rights activists. A husband and wife who themselves had gotten this call from a longtime school administrator in Indiana. The administrator's family had kept it in a closet for decades. The family's patriarch was a doctor in Richmond, Virginia in the early 20th century. One of his patients was the daughter of a physician who was present when Turner's body was cut up. For years, Hatcher held on to the skull, but in 2016, long after it became clear the Hall of Fame wouldn't happen, he agreed with the National Geographic Society facilitating to hand over the skull to the descendants of Nat Turner. Again, descendants, cousins, and two Turner great-great-great-great-great-granddaughters, Shanna Baton, Aguirre, and Shelley Lucas Wood, took possession of the skull and turned it over to a team led by Douglas Owsley at the National Museum of Natural History for forensic analysis. For me, the skull in and of itself is a very symbolic and emotional reference point, said Aguirre, who like Wood lives in Maryland. Obviously, if we are able to determine that it is the skull of our ancestor, that would be tremendously important on a spiritual and emotional level for the family all right again these are real people and these people were not created by an act of congress just want to keep pointing that out matt turner or nathaniel turner was a real person his story of what he did now that's a whole other thing again that was written by thomas gray i wanted to distinguish that i hope that's clear to you guys now he does have many living descendants I haven't even gotten into the tree yet. She is quick to point out that she does not speak for all Turner descendants who seven generations on are numerous. Again, are numerous. Seven generations is numerous. None of these people were created by an act of Congress. These are real people. All right, a little further down, just want to uh, close into this picture. There's here Bruce Turner, a great, 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 great grandson of Nat Turner at home in Virginia Beach. Again, real people. This is not an act of Congress only. And by the way, I never saw no act of Congress in the whole video actually stating what he was saying. Again, these are real people. Now, uh, just to continue and just corroborate uh, what we read earlier regarding Gilbert Turner. Uh, this is the story of Nat Turner's descendants. Again, descendants, real people. Negro History Bulletin, Volume 10, Number 7, April 1947, by Lucy May Turner and Fanny Turner. Remember, they were saying their ancestor, Gilbert, is his son. And as you guys can see here, Gilbert Turner, the son of Nat Turner, was a small boy when the insurrection occurred. His mother and all his brothers and sisters were sold away from him to the far south to be worked arduously on the large plantations. Is that what really happened? where it was hoped they would soon die and no more trouble the whites with insurrections. A white Christian lady, his young mistress, married 
took an interest in the little Gilbert, who was very pleasant, affectionate, and lovable in disposition. He was courageous too and fearless. This lady hid Gilbert away and resolved that he should not suffer the fate of his older brothers and sisters. Furthermore, she felt that Nat Turner had been treated inhumanly and that cruelty was the cause of the insurrection. In her kindly Christian heart, she felt that people of her race had done wrong. She saw the resemblance of the little Gilbert to his father, Nat Turner. She resolved to protect Gilbert and thus partly atone for the sins of her people. All right, so, you know, that's the story. This is a story they have, and they wrote it in, in this journal right here, the supposed, you know, descendants. But I just wanted to show you a lot of people, you know, are saying, hey, that's our ancestor. All right, we're in the website tidewaternews.com. It says here, descendants offer his hiding place to be part of driving tour, just from 2011, way back. It says here, no matter how dark or bright some moments are, history teaches all of us important lessons. Take, for example, Alvin Turner and Evelyn Hawkins. They are descendants of Nat Turner and have inherited two farms in the family. Descendants who inherited farms. All right. Some more descendants. Again, real people. Evelyn Hawkins has strong memories of that cave because her grandfather, Sidney Turner, often took her and his other 12 grandchildren across the farm to the famous site. She says it wasn't as much a cave as it was a hole that Nat Turner appeared to have dug with his sword. Hawkins, who is now 72, and her relatives are hoping that the Southampton County Historical Society will give the thumbs up to the iconic landmark and allow the location of the cave to become part of a proposed driving tour. The relatives of Sidney Turner believe that society as a whole could benefit by keeping this key part of history alive for future generations. They want to do their grandfather proud. So Rick Francis, uh, Southampton County Circuit Court Clerk, is trying to help him get this happen. Says Francis would like to see a sign erected at the side of the cave that told the story of Nat Turner and include photographs of what the location appeared like during Nat Turner's hideout there. All right, so these are his descendants right here. So you guys can see. Hawkins says that a number of people know the story of Nat Turner's rebellion and would often call her grandparents from afar to ask about the cave and be allowed to see the site. The granddaughter explained that when folks come to Southampton County, they want to learn more about Nat Turner. This would be a fine opportunity to make the location part of the tour. The famous piece of land features two farms and is owned by the grandchildren together, all right, real people. It is called the Sid Core Turner Farms. Sidney Turner's descendants all approve of the proposal to add Nat Turner's cave to the driving tour. They include Hawkins, Alvin, L. Turner, Vivian Lucas, Bradley S. Hardy, Lamonte Hardy, Eloise Pearson, Young Young, Jason Turner, Joyce T. Lewis, Yvonne T. Reeves, Sandra Sykes, Ann T. Mason, and a Sidney Turner. Evelyn Hawkins and her cousins are all tightly knit, and she was raised by her grandparents, Sidney and Corrine Turner, until she was 12. The farm is their lifeblood. It is what their family knows. Living descendants. Real people. So now we get to the part where I can explain to you guys, you know, how I created the tree. Because I had nothing, you know. I didn't know anything until I started doing the research and looking for living uh, descendants. Again, I didn't do this to disrespect the family or intrude. It's just for getting the facts and to help everybody else see the bigger picture of what happened to almost all so-called black families. The misclassification and the paper genocide had a big impact in what we believe today when it comes to ancestry. I have an actual name of a living person. I had many, but with them I had actual grandparents too. So I have Alvin, right? And then we have Sydney and Corrine. And believe it or not, with that, I was able to build a tree. I didn't know Elvin's dad's name or mom, but I knew the grandparents. So I added the grandparents and I just left his dad with a last name with no first name. And I got hints 
for Sydney and Corrine right away. So here we go, guys. This is the tree right here. And uh, what we're looking at is Sydney Turner, Ellis slash Ellis, you'll see why, and Kareen Turner. And just both actually being Turners. You know, from Sydney and Kareen, we can probably travel up. Again, these are the lines I use to get to Nat. We see here Kareen's parents are James Turner and Fanny Turner. We see at the 1900 census with Kareen, she's nine years old living in Southampton, Virginia, Boykins. And a little close up here says mother's name, Fanny Turner. When you look at the list of who's living here, you find Corrine, her siblings, her mom, and her grandmother, Charlotte. It's not stiff, st but still. 1910 census, she's 19, it says here. Uh, again, living with Fanny, 1930 census. About 37 years old, still in Southampton, uh, Virginia. Here she's living with her husband, Sidney Turner. And here in this uh, census, we have Sidney's mom, Laura, Laura Turner. Okay, so again, remember, both of them are Turners. I have many uh, death birth certificates related to Corrine, her children and, her, and hers. Here we have Corrine's uh, death certificate. Listen, her dad is James Turner and mother Fanny. As you guys can see with a question mark, who gave this information? The informant being the daughter, Elizabeth Nabors. As you guys can see, daughter. So she should know her grandparents, right? But we have her Corrine's parents again. Now we know the dad, James Turner, and the mom again, Fanny. So again, James Turner and Fanny Turner. And again, yes, both seem to have Turner in their family on both sides. We'll get to that. So basically, we're going to the maternal line of Corrine right now. All right, so we're going to go into uh, Fanny's uh, profile. So Fanny was born October 13th, 1858 in Capron, Southampton, Virginia. They look at the 1880 census. She's 22, about, and has her as the daughter of Charlotte Stith. Okay, so we got her mom, Charlotte Stith. And just to look at the uh, actual census of itself, we got Charlotte Stith right here and Fanny, daughter. And they said they're all farm laborers. Okay. 1900 census. It's 20 years later, about 40 years old, uh, still uh, in Boykin, Southampton, Virginia. And again, Charlotte uh, Stith, or Stiff, as it says, they're, they're still living with her. And we can see again, Corrine down in the bottom here. All right, so apart from the uh, census stating uh, her mother, Charlotte uh, Stith, there was also other uh, family trees which were stating uh, the same thing. And here we got, uh, in this case, the dad, John Turner, which I didn't add because it seems they were trying to add another son of Nat Turner. We're going to see Charlotte is actually, according to a lot of the families here, Nat Turner's daughter. So if it was a John Turner, it might have been not the one that was the son of uh, Nat Turner, which is the one they're adding, but maybe another John Turner. We're going to see how many John Turners there is actually uh, in this small town. The Turners are very widespread in this town, and they kept repeating names. But this family has Charlotte Stiff, right? as the mom, John Turner. Sandy's family has John Turner and Charlotte Stiff, too. This family also has uh, Charlotte Stiff. Scroll down. Everybody has Charlie. So what I want to show you is that the Nat John Turner they add in here is the supposed son of Nat Turner, as you guys see here. And let's go back. So this is somebody else's tree, right? And then if we go into Charlotte's, we have Nat Turner again. And we got the wife that keeps popping up, which is Cherry or Cherry, Creasy, Reese, Turner. So they can't be brother and sister. So it has to be another John Turner, if so. But I didn't never found any sources stating John was her dad. We only saw the ones where Charlotte is with Fanny. Two different sources. And there was no dad. You guys remember that? So I left on my tree, on the tree that I have, I don't have a dad. There was no sources linking no John to Fanny. But I do know that Nat Turner and Creasy did have a son named John. And it's possibly... 
Charlotte's brother instead of a husband that they're confusing with. So as I expand this, you guys can see the siblings. And Riddick, remember earlier, one of his sons was Riddick. Another one was Gertrude. Okay, we got the living descendants stories, right? They mentioned these people. And then we got John Turner right here. So many children, not just one. And this is the exact same one with the exact same info. So, you know, can't be her husband. That's her brother. So, Cody Mill, you're saying Charlotte is the daughter of Nathaniel. Well, not just me. A lot of families. We know Charlotte is Fanny's mom. We're going to get the actual account of a living descendant. Given the genealogy and stating all these names to confirm what I found. Now, let's go into Charlotte. Now, let's just go through her records real quick. 1870 census. I got a Charlotte Stiff here. Would be around 44 in 1870. So these, you know, she was already older when these census were coming out and being used. So what I want to point out is that since she had actual married a Carter Stiff, that's where she's getting the Stiff name from. So most likely by the time 1880 came and she's living with uh, Fanny, her daughter, he's not around and she might be widowed. But look how they put race and white. And this is something you guys got to really pay attention to right now. Don't assume that's correct. Don't assume, even if it was, even if the census did say white, don't assume it is so-called white. <laughs> but I want to show you how they try to throw you off right here so you don't continue. They put white. Nobody would ever imagine this would be Nat Turner's daughter, right? Of course not. He didn't have no white children, right? When you go to the actual census and zoom in, right? As you guys can see, Charlotte and Carter Stiff, right? She's listed as B for so-called black, okay? B for black. You see W? You see B? Color race? She's so-called black. Why did they put white? on the actual digital part when they created this entry and the software huh to throw you off completely why would they put white it clearly says b on it right i wanted you guys to see that this is going to happen a lot so look out for that stuff when you're doing your genealogy be careful don't assume again 1880 charlotte is 53 about she's widow like i said and she's living with fanny so that's definitely her daughter, and that's her mom. And again, Ray, so-called black, right? So they try to change her. This is a death record of Charlotte uh, Stith. And it says here, widow, date of death, 1912. It says she's about 80 here. It says birthplace, Nottaway County. Father name, don't know. Mother's name, don't know, don't know. You see how convenient they don't know anything. What happened to the informant in this case? Where is the informant? Where are the family members? The informant is blank. How convenient. Because if she was Nathaniel Turner's daughter or Nat Turner's daughter, it would be kind of controversial to just see his name right here pop up, right? Oh, we don't know. We don't know. Just wanted to show you guys that. And they obviously didn't ask family or they didn't want to put that they did ask family. They just left it blank. So many uh, families had their trees and they had Charlotte as the daughter of Nathaniel, Nat Turner and Cressy Cherry Chase Reese. As you guys can see, all right, Nathaniel, Nat Turner, the Sandy's family, the Ever Stevens family has Nat Turner, the Brunson third family has Nat Turner and Cherry, the Turner Bowles family, Nathaniel, Nat Turner. The Turner Hayward family has Nat Turner. So a lot of different families or tradition knew this, guys. This is what I want to point out. And of course, you get to Nat Turner. And remember what they tell us that he didn't know his uh, dad. And he only knew his mom. Which was eventually we find out Nancy Turner, as you see here. So of course, we don't have no actual real you know, sources for Nat. Because they don't want you to have no real sources for him. We do have stories. Uh, we have a grave uh index supposedly you know all right and again southampton county and courtland southampton county is where he passed away again right where the uh sharon hoka indians or not away indians were right real quick i'm in the uh, website battlefields.org american battlefield trust it says here biography of nat turner 
Nat Turner was born on October 2nd, 1800 in Southampton County, Virginia, as a slave of Benjamin Turner. His mother was an enslaved woman named Nancy, but his father is unknown. All oh, right. So she was enslaved, Nancy, really? Turner was allowed to learn how to read and write. Oh, how convenient. They let him do all that, right, as a slave. And he was instructed in religious matters, right? So I just want to read that, you know, it was known that his mom was Nancy, okay? So let's go back to the tree. I got Nancy. So is Benjamin Turner Nat Turner's dad or not? You know, something that nobody can prove right or wrong. But like John McGee was saying, on the older traditions he investigated, it seems it was Benjamin Turner. Did this Benjamin Turner have an out of wedlock uh, relationship with this Nancy Turner who was working under him? Is she a niece? Is she a family member? Are things that are left up for uh, investigation? But we do know Nancy Turner was Nat Turner's mom. And I'm just going to ask you guys to bear with me. I'm trying to break this down as simple as I can. It's not easy. We're going to be going back and forth a lot. So according to two different uh, family trees, uh, as you see here, Nancy Turner was the daughter of Thomas Woodson Jr. and Edith Turner. All right, so we're back in the book, uh, Turner, Descendants of the Cherenhoka Nottaway Indians by William Henson. So under Benjamin Turner, again, as the story goes, right? Uh, you know, he gave, you know, Nat Turner, his slave to his son, Samuel, as it says here, you guys can see. It says that Samuel was born in 1776 in Luke's parish. And as you guys see, a possible half-brother to Nat Turner, Samuel G. Turner, right here, the guys who supposedly own him. Right, it says Samuel, his cause of death was murdered by his slave, Nat Turner. Look what it says here. So Nat Turner was with him, has relation with him, do know these people. Okay? That's possibly his brother. Was that what really happened? And did Samuel really die? In 1831, I found no records of that. And the death date that we had for uh, Samuel was a different year. But again, supposedly Nat Turner murdered him, right? A possible half-brother. Well, who knows what happened, really? How he ended up being murdered. Was it really Nat Turner who murdered him, right? Or was he being blamed for it? Then it says, that started the Turner Rebellion. And it says here, fact one, owned the famous black slave Nat Turner. Born Thomas Woodson Jr. Hold up. Nat Turner was born Thomas Woodson Jr. Hey guys, when I read this, I was like, hold up. What is this guy? Now I started looking for Thomas Woodson Jr. So going back to the tree, when we find out uh, Nancy, his mom, her parents appear to be Thomas Woodson, all right, Jr. and Edith. Edith a.k.a. Wane Montserrat, the Nottaway Indian chieftess. She is the queen. Yes, Nancy, Nat Turner's grandmother, right? Woodson, just like they said, not his name, but the grandson of Thomas Woodson, right? That's what Nat Turner is. Now, before we continue, guys, I want to show you this. Shout out to uh, this page right here, uh, Facebook Underground American Aborigine. A post from 2018 I ended up running into when I was doing this research. And it was so interesting what it was saying here. It said, Nat Turner, the American Aborigine, not a way Indian, not African slave. Nat Turner's entire family is on the not a way Indian census. 1808, not a way Indian census. Nancy Turner, that's Nat Turner's mom. Edie Turner, the chief, which ends up being... His grandmother, because that's Nancy Turner's mom, Tom Turner and Henry Turner. First and foremost, he was fighting to reclaim his stolen land. All right. So, you know, this is the person's post. You know, I'm just reading what it says here. They were an Aboriginal American tribe labeled colored, Negro, as well as many other misnomer classifications by Europeans. Negro was an early American Indian classification or label used by Europeans. All right. So we got the drop on that. We already know that. But. Very interesting what it's saying, right? That brings me back to the Sharon Hoka, uh, notaway.org um, website. You know, their official website. They have a part here 
where they actually got the transcript of the census to see the following enumeration of the Cherenhoka Nottaway Indian tribe was abstracted from the executive papers July 1st, 22nd, 1808, located at the Library of Virginia, Archives Division, Richmond, Virginia. The tribal census is contained in a letter to the governor from the trustees of the Cherenhoka Nottaway Indian tribe dated July 18th, 1808. The trustees were seeking instructions concerning the leasing and or division of the Cherenhoka Nottaway Indian lands and as such predicted their enumeration based on a matrilineal line, matrilineal. All patrilineal male descendants' children were negated from the count. They weren't included. This method of enumerating reduced the number of Indians the trustees would have to deal with in any future land transfers. It is noted that the division of the Nottoway land did not come about until after the William Boozman Act of 1823, some 15 years later. From this author's perspective, the census was a forerunner of attempting to get around the federal government's 1790 Indian Non-Intercourse Act, which prohibited any land sales between the Indians and non-Indian members of the Commonwealth, only if the federal government intervened. The following census materials presented close to the original format. The census list includes males, their ages, their employments, and some general remarks about their character, followed by a list of the females with the same information. The amount of acreage they tilled and some genealogical data is included in the general remarks of the trustees. It should be noted that the census takers did not count some children, even though they carried a minimum of half the Indian blood they didn't count some children and left a lot of people out from an ethno historic point research has revealed that many of the Cherenhoka Nottaway Indians had common law wives and or common law husbands with children so here's a list of the people and it starts with little 10 scholar as you guys can see then we got a Tom Turner who's 36 says tillage when he works his employment at present unknown as he has left his farm in the possession of a mulatto woman who has been kept by him as a wife. The greater part of his time has been generally spent in drunkenness and the destruction of what little crop he has made. All right, so remember how they were making him drunk and then putting them in debt and then they would have to, uh, you know, pay that debt with their land. They would get, so they were taking the land from them at the same time. Then down here, we got a Henry Turner who's 16 years old, employed by his mother making a crop. Again, that's Nancy. Turner, remember, that is the mom of Nat Turner. She did have a son named Henry Turner. Henry Turner was registered in 1844 on Free Negro and Mulatto census. We'll go a little bit more down. We have Eddie or Edith Turner, 54 years. Her employments are knitting, sewing, and what is usual in common housewifery. 34 acres. She has had two Negroes hired for her last year by the trustees and this year by her husband. Again, she had what? so-called two Negroes, right? Does that mean African slaves? No, and it did say hired, right? It did say hired, indentured servitude, bonded. So this is Nat Turner's grandma, right? We're not talking about evil white slave masters here. Her family consists of herself, Polly Woodson, and John Woodson, whose allowances are paid to her for their maintenance, all right? She has them indebted, her daughters, her own kids, they have an indenture. They used to indenture their own kids. This was normal. Rich and poor did this back then, guys. This is how they learned to trade. This is how they worked. An 1819 marriage license between Ed of Turner and William Green, Southampton County Courts, lists them as a free person of color. Free person of color. In 1820, she was dubbed Queen, Chief of the Sharon Hoka, Nottaway Indian Tribe, Southampton County. All right, She's the chief. Then under her, we got Nancy, right? She is her daughter. This is Nat Turner's mom, guys. 34 years old, knitting, sewing, weaving, 15 acres. Also, three acres worked at her desire and without permission by a free Negro. A free Negro. He's not a slave. He's free. Worked. He's getting paid. The Indian part of her family is composed of herself. She's an Indian. And son, Henry Turner, whose allowances she receives. So she has her son indentured, too. She's receiving his payments. He ain't getting paid. He's working for free because he's a child, but his mom's getting the money. That's what happened back then. Now, I want to point out, they did mention up here, it should be noted that the census takers did not count some children. Even 
though they carried a minimum of half Indian bloodline. They left out Nat. That was her child. Of course, they're going to leave him out. There's not a popular history with him. This is Nat Turner's family on an 1808 census of the Charon Hoka Nottaway Indians. Again, Nancy with Thomas Turner, you guys are going to see, had Henry, who was in the census, but they left Nat out. Again, possibly a son of Benjamin. What's going on here? And again, Edith, the queen, the chief, right? A.K.A. Wani Munsera, not a way Indian. Let's go into her real quick. In 1830, listing her as a free colored person. And it says she had total slaves, one. <laughs> All right, so this is probably family. This is what I'm saying. They had their own kids indentured. And this is what you got to look out for. Now, a quick bio of Edith Turner right here. It says Sharon Hoka, not a way Indian blood, line of Edith Turner. Native name, Wanye Roncera, queen of the Cherin Hoka Nottaway Indian tribe. This is compiled by Chief Walt Red Hawk Brown, all right, the tribal historian. She was born in 1754, died 1838. Edith Turner's probated will in the courts of Southampton County noted that she left her household goods to one of the Cherin Hoka Nottaway Indians by the name of Edwin Turner. We're going to see who that is, okay? Remember that. Now, well, something I want to read here, we're going to read a lot, is that uh, Thomas Jefferson says here communicates to Peter S. Duponce that the vocabulary of the Sharon Hoka Nottaway Indian was obtained from an old Indian woman who, according to Jefferson, her intellect was higher than the lower order slaves by the name of Eddie Turner or Edith. All right. She was able to help. She was the one that kept the language alive and showed it to the uh, settlers. The Library of Virginia recognized Edith Eddie Turner as Sharon Hoka, not away Indian, and posthumously honor her as such in a Virginia woman in history, formal ceremony in an open forum at the Library of Virginia in Richmond, Virginia. It was documented by the Library of Virginia that Edith Turner was chief queen of the Sharon Hoka, not away Indian tribe, having been the only chief in the 18th century, having left a written will directing the distributions of her assets at her death. Her will was probated in the courts of Southampton County, Virginia, on February 26, 1838. A little bit further down, again, it says here, Thomas Jefferson on the vocabulary of the Sharon Hoka Nottaway Indians as obtained from Eddie Turner by John Wood, a former professor of mathematics at William and Mary College on the 4th of March, 1820, documented as an Iroquoian language. And that was thanks to Edith Turner, all right? Nat Turner's grandma. Yes. Here, I got a couple records for her, a letter of her petition to the trustees about her being able to sell the land, her marriage record to uh, William Green right here, the Nottaway Indian census again. But back in the book, Turner, descendants of the Sharon Hoka, Nottaway Indians. Down here it says Nancy Turner was also known as Nanny Turner. In fact, one, it says half Iroquois Sharon Hoka Indian, Nancy Turner. We're talking about Nat Turner's mom. Again, notes for Nancy Turner by Chief Red Hawk Brown. His research, Nancy Turner, Nanny. So these are some notes on her asking to sell the land. We saw the uh, letter. It says here, wanted plot of reservation land. Then after that, it says, God half plot of reservation land. Then it says, in 1839, she sued Indian trustees to get rest of plot reservation land. Wait, so that's, so Nat Turner's mom had to sue these trustees. Who are these trustees? controlling everything who was nat turner really going after was it so-called just white people or was it these trustees that his mom was actually suing right here i thought that was kind of big right here sued indian trustees to get rest of plot of reservation land they weren't trying to give her the land says thomas turner nancy had the following children mary woodson turner which we got in the tree and henry turner which we also got in the tree now, regarding Edith, again, remember this, it was saying that she was the one that helped with the language. Uh, it says here, the Nottaway language became extinct well before 1900. At that time of European contact, 1650, speakers numbered only in the hundreds. From then until 1735, a number of colonists learned that language and acted as official interpreters for the colony of Virginia, including Thomas Blunt, Henry Briggs, and Thomas Wynn. These interpreters also served the adjacent Meheran, as well as the Nansimon, who spoke Nottaway. In addition, 
to their own Algonquin Valley or Powhatan. The last two interpreters were dismissed in 1735 since the Nottoway by then were using English. By 1820, there were said to be only three elderly speakers of the Nottoway remaining. In that year, John O'Wood collected over 250 word samples from one of these chief queen, Edith Turner. He sent them to Thomas Jefferson, who shared them with Peter Stephen Duponce and their correspondence. These two men quickly confirmed the Nottoway language as being of the Iroquois family. All right, so thanks to Edith Turner, right? Nat Turner's grandmother. This year, Edith Turner was also known as Eddie Turner, Wane Runsera, three-fourth Iroquois, Shirenhoka, Nottoway, Indian. She was known by the title of Queen. So a couple of lists of her records here. Now, Edith eventually says here married one William Green, who appears to have been a non-Indian in 1819. Turner was also active as a foster mother and advocate for Nottoway children, successfully petitioning white trustees. Oh, white! the whites are the trustees. Return for the reservation. So again, who is Nat Turner really going after? She is known to have met Jedediah Morse in 1820. As old, she traveled the United States studying Indians at the president's request to describe her as the reigning queen of the tribe and praise her intelligence and business sense. She is also remembered as one of the last three speakers of the Nottoway language, which became extinct sometime before 1900. It says in 1821 that she taught children Nottoway tradition as well as how to exist in a white-dominated society. She was also the only member of the tribe at the time to write a will, a brief document which makes no mention of relatives, which leaves the book of the state to one Edwin Turner, whose relationship to her is unknown. And I'm going to show who Edwin Turner is. At least one later chief of the tribe, Walter David Bedhawk Brono, the third is descended from one of her foster children. Turner was named one of the library's Virginia's, Virginia Women in History for 2008. All right, so that was a little bit on Edith, Eddie Turner, her husband, William Green, as you guys can see here, Thomas Woodson, we got all that right here. This is what was popping up, you know, and um, there was some records attached to this stuff. Again, possibly talking about Nat Turner's grandmother. Now, her parents, and the reason they were saying she's half, full blood almost, because literally her dad is uh, also known as an Indian, James Turner, and Mary Skipper. The Skippers were also known as an indigenous family here with the uh, Sharon Hoka and other uh, tribes in the area. You guys are going to see about George Skipper and Mary Bailey. We're going to go back down to Nancy, going back down to Nathaniel. Just trying to remember, just trying to show you guys how we got here. Remember, Nathaniel supposedly was married to a Creasy Cherry Reese. We do have some records for a Cherry Turner right here who was widowed in 1880 at 85 in Prince George, Virginia. I found this find a grave listing, Cherry Turner. It says here was the spouse of Nat Turner. It is largely speculated that Nat and Cherry met and were married at Samuel Turner's plantation in the early 1820s. Although historians still dispute who exactly Nat Turner's wife was, further than the issue, claims about Nat Turner are difficult to verify. It is widely believed that Cherry did have children, but it is undetermined how many. Historians vary anywhere between believing she had one to three children. The most widely held belief is that the pair had two or three children, one daughter and one or two sons. Historians believe one of their children was a slave boy named Riddick. All right, so, so I just want to show you here uh, that they have not only just Riddick, but they also got Charlotte. All right, Charlotte still, remember, who is Fanny's mom that goes down and links to Kareen and eventually to Alvin and others that we will hear from today. This is their ancestors. And Charlotte is here. It's not just me saying that. It's more people know. And here goes Gilbert, too. All right, so they know who it is uh, in reality. I want to read uh, from a book real quick. The name of the book is The Land Shall Be Deluged in Blood, A New History of the Nat Turner Revolt by Patrick H. Breen. And real quick, it says here, portraits of Nat Turner's family are also imperfect. His family life when he was growing up seems relatively stable. He later recounted how both his parents influenced him in his youth and how he knew at least one grandmother to whom he was much attached. All right. A grandmother. We're talking about Edith, his grandmother. But remember, these are the accounts. They get in this from that book, <laughs> The Confession of Nat Turner by Thomas Gray. His account. All right. It's not really Nat Turner's account. 
that as with countless other black families in the South, slavery played a role in the breakup of his family. His father ran away, as Turner later recalled, again, dodged the hijack, that's from that book. Although the protections of legal marriages were antithetical to the American system of slavery, Nat Turner married. All right? Even though slaves are not supposed to, Nat Turner married because it really didn't go down how they told you it went down. Historians have disputed the identity of Turner's wife with at least three different women, Fanny, Sherry, and Mariah, all right? Sherry's up in there, proposed by different people, all right? We got the Fanny story already. Contemporary evidence for Nat Turner's children is less clear, even than the evidence about his wife. At the time of the revolt, no sources mention any of Turner's children, right? How convenient, because then people would have went and asked them who would have been too young to participate in the revolt themselves. Southampton's oral traditions filled in a blank. According to William Sidney Drury, Nat Turner had his son, Redrick, because slave law ruled that Turner's children would belong to his wife's owner, Redrick, and any siblings he may have had would have lived with their mother on Mr. Reeves' farm. Is that their grandfather, their mom's dad? All right, so I just want to show you guys that, you know, Sherry is in the mix there for sure. So I just wanted to backtrack a little bit from Nathaniel. We're going to go back again. Here's Riddick, the person they're saying. We got him right here. We got Gertrude and we got Charlotte. As you guys saw in that uh, listing, Charlotte was listed there. And this Jeannie uh, listing, Jeannie.com, I also found that Charlotte was listed twice. Charlotte Stiff, right? Father of Charlotte Stiff and Charlotte Turner, right? Charlotte Turner. When you click on Charlotte Turner, it's the same person, Charlotte Stiff and Charlotte Turner. They just duplicated her. It says she is the mother as you guys can see, of Fanny Turner, correlating what we had, who is the mother of Corrine Turner, right? Who is the mother of Herbert Turner, right? <laughs> and Herbert is the dad of Alvin. Now, this list, and it goes not Daniel's wife, not as Reese, but as Stith. So that has, adds a whole different thing to it. Charlotte might be getting the Stith from her mom, too. Again, mother of Charlotte Stith, wife of Nathaniel Nat Turner, Creasy, or Cherry. All right, so remember how we got here? We got here through Fanny, as you guys can see, which was Corrine's mom. Real quick, we're going to go up. James Turner, which is Fanny's husband. As you guys can see, this will be Corrine's dad. James Turner, 10 years old, listed as mulatto. As you guys can see, the son of Edwin and Betsy. Edwin Turner and Betsy. 1870-17, again, Edwin and Betsy. It's something very important I wanted to show you about this census, all right? Let's zoom in. We're going to read this. It says James Turner, age 17, birth date, 1853, birthplace, Virginia, dwelling number, eight, home in 1870, Boyd's Depot, Southampton, Virginia, race, Indian, Native American, all right? Indian, Native American, inferred father, Edwin Turner, and for the mother, Betsy Turner. So if he's an Indian, what does that make his parents and his children, guys? American Indians, right? So Corrine is an American Indian, his dad. And through Nat Turner's line, there's indigenous over there too. That there's indigenous on both sides of Fanny, all right, on her people. Now I wanted to show you what that looks like in the census. Again, this is the 1870 census. And you guys can see on the race, it has I-N. Under everybody, I-N, I-N-D, I-N-D, Indians, 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 including James, Indians, Indians. Again, who is James? James is Fanny's husband. Who was Fanny? Granddaughter of Nat Turner. Nat Turner is a grandson of Edith, the queen or chief of the Nottoways. James Turner is also a Nottoway. And remember that it told us that Edith left everything to a so-called Edwin Turner that they didn't know who it was. Well, here he is, Edwin Turner. He's also from the same tribe, most likely related to Edith as well in a different way. And you can see this is James Turner's and Fanny's father-in-law, Edwin Turner. Going into Edwin Turner real quick. 1840, free person of color, free person of color. You already know what that means. 1850, now he's so-called white. Do you guys see that? They put white here. Does it really say white on the census? Let me show you. Under the race part, 
is left blank. It's left blank. So because they are Indians, they want you to assume these are white. They classify them as white. All right? But that's them. We have an 1860 slave schedule. All right? Southampton. Yeah, he had a farm. But most of the people working under him, his family, and other people he had employed. So that's why you got to be careful when you look at these slave schedules and you find your relatives or you find a person that's supposed to be on the schedule it doesn't mean that's their slave master. There he is, Edwin Turner. Remember that Edith left everything to him. It makes sense that he would have land here, a farm. The actual regular 1860 census, again, listed him as mulatto. Same guy, West Side, Nottoway River. Just where the slave schedule was. Again, Betsy and James Turner. All right, he's not a slave master. I'm glad all this came up so I can show you guys. You got to be careful when you read the census, what you're really reading. Again, Edwin Turner, Indian, Native American. Yeah, if you only see that slave schedule, you would assume he was a white uh, slave master, right? But you got to dodge your own hijacks. You got to be very careful. You got to really understand what you're seeing. We got an Edwin Turner here, Southampton. Says he have U.S. Freedman Bureau's record, property owner, and many other records here. As you guys can see, these are real people, real records. I wasn't able to get his parents, and you guys understand why. We're looking at Indians here. So when it comes to Fanny's husband, James, we're, we're talking about Corrine's dad. Corrine's dad's side ends up with Edwin, the guy who inherited everything from Edith, Nat Turner's grandma. Remember that Edith passed away in 1838. Edwin was born in 1815, so definitely possible. He married Betsy Beaton. And I remember all these names because they come up in that book we're reading. The turn of the descendants of the Sharon Holka tribe. Now I want to go back down to Corrine. Now remember that we had started the tree and we got most of the hints when we started adding Sydney and Corrine to the tree. That's when we opened up everything. I want to take you up. Her husband now, who's also a Turner. So you're going to see it's related to all these people. We're going to go up his line now. Again, that was Sidney Turner or Sidney Turner Ellis. And we open up his tree and we see that his parents are Richard or Dick P. Ellis, born in 1848 and died in 1913. And the mom is Laura or Laurie Turner. All right, Turner's coming from his mom's side. He actually took his mom's name. That's why they're both Turner. That's why him and Corinne are Turners, but he should have been an Ellis if that's his biological dad. We're going to see going into his records. Now, remember that they were saying that Sidney was the one that was showing everybody the cave, the grand, his grandkids, telling them that they were descendants of Nat Turner. In the 1900 census, Sidney is 16 years old. And it says here he is living under Laura Turner, his mother. 1910, Sydney is listed as mulatto <laughs> under Laura Turner still. She's 65 now. And of course, his siblings. 1920, he's about 36. Now he's with Corrine. He's married. And then we see Laurie or Laura still there. She's about 70 now. So you guys see that is his actual mom. You see that the dad is not listed in any of the census, so he probably didn't grow up with his dad. He was in World War I, World War II. Here we have his death certificate. Sidney Turner, as you guys can see here, 84 years of age, 1968, Southampton Memorial Hospital, uh, in Capron, Southampton. And it says here, name of father, Richard Ellis. All right, so that is his dad, Richard Ellis, and name of mother, Laura Y. Turner. Laura White Turner, married to Corrine Turner. So we definitely got the right person here, Corrine Turner. So again, his parents, Richard Ellis and Laura Turner. Now, on the Ellis side, I didn't really focus much, okay? I did realize that it seems that these people are very light-skinned. They passed as white almost everything, or they are actually are white, or, you know, that she got with a so-called white man, all right? And ain't nothing wrong with that. A lot of the descendants are very light-skinned. But that doesn't say anything. Remember that Nat Turner was described as bright, complexioned. But when it comes to Laura Turner, right, we're going to go into Laura Turner's genealogy. Again, she's a Turner, and we're going to find a lot of interesting things on her side. In 1800, Laura's 23. Again, she's declared as mulatto. They got her living here supposedly alone. And it says she's a cook. 
and she's living with her son Jim. She's listed as mulatto, 1900, and this is when she's living with uh, Sydney, 1900, and you see Sydney here at 16. She's 50 years old. I was able to find her uh, death certificate, Laura Turner, Capron, Virginia, or Southampton, as you guys can see, C for colored. You already know that's code. Date of birth, 1848. Passed away 1940 of old age. It says the name of her dad is John Turner. And the maiden name or her mother is Elizabeth Mowbray. And who gave this information? Her son, Sidney. All right, Sidney. So he must have known his grandparents. He's the one that provided the information. So this is very reliable. All right, we have her parents, John Turner and Elizabeth Mowbray. So here they are, John Turner and Elizabeth Mabry, this what you see right here. I'm going to show you guys Elizabeth Turner, right? That's a real picture. We're going to see somebody. We're going to hear somebody that actually has the actual picture in her house, a living descendant. When it comes to John Turner, that's kind of where I ended up. Wasn't able to find anything. That's all I got from him. About 1818, I didn't have no age. All I had was the uh, death certificate. It doesn't list age or basis for the people. So I didn't have much. I was able to put 1818 about just to uh, see if I can get any hints. And I haven't yet. Again, a lot of uh, John Turner's. Let me just show you guys in this tree. John Turner, John Turner, John Turner, John Turner. The names repeat in these families, guys. So it could get pretty confusing. But I wanted to show Elizabeth Turner, Marbury, as you see here, Wright. So she married somebody Wright, so that's why she was carrying the Wright last name. 1880 census, listen, her so-called black. She's 57 here. And this is when she's married to a Hall Wright, 1900. She's widowed, about 79. As you guys can see, it's in Southampton. These people have been there. This is where it all happened, right? The Nat, Nat Turner Rebellion. So uh, many different family trees had Elizabeth Turner's parents as Simon Turner and Lucy Turner. The Stephen Turner Brancombe family, Allen, they had Simon and Lucy. In search of the Burr family, Donna Wilson has Simon Turner, Lucy Little, and so on and so on. So a lot of the times it helps when people actually remember and there's actual family members doing these trees because they fill in the blanks. We end up finding out uh, Simon, his dad is Green Turner and Dorcas uh, Turner. Again, two different Turners coming together. And then we got Simon again, his dad, Elizabeth Pearson or Pearson. Then we got Simon Turner the first, Patience Everett, his wife. And that's where I was able to get. I didn't get anything past that. I'm still in Virginia. On Dorcas Turner's side, we got Thomas Turner. I told you there's a lot of Thomases. Ended up in Virginia with him. And these two are actually cousins because Simon and Thomas are brothers, are siblings. And these two are cousins. And that's what kept coming up, that they were siblings. And just because you get hints, guys, doesn't mean they're always accurate. Once you get to these years, they try to really make everybody here European. They're not supposed to be, you know, any so-called black folks free or anything like that. You're not supposed to even be thinking about that. A lot of the hints are guesses. You got to hit no and go over them and make sure you're not just adding things because you see similar names in England or oh, it has to be him. You know, that's not the case. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this stuff, guys, and again, these are all Turner still, is because all these names are going to pop up in that book. All those names are going to pop up in the book. And we're also going to get another living descendant uh, throw out some of these names so you guys can see. I didn't just make this tree up. And I just want you guys, hopefully, so far to notice, you know, nothing about any so-called Africans or anything like that. All that stuff is added conjectures. Whenever you see that, you got to really look for records or sources. Something that really says, okay, yeah, they came off this ship, literally from Africa. And so all these people you're going to see are also sharing Hoka Indians, a lot of them. I'm going to show you. They're in that book. Now, we're going to go watch a video, A Living Descendant you know, getting interviewed about her genealogy. She's going to mention a lot of these names. Uh, before we go, just know that we're going to come back to all this. We have, we're not done on the uh, mom side again when it comes to Corrine and Fanny. And Edith, Edith's parents, again, was James Turner, remember, and Mary Skipper. The Skippers are known to be related to the indigenous people and also the Baileys. You guys are going to see, as you see here, Marianne Bailey, her dad, Chief, Walter or Walt Bailey and Mary Etheridge. All right, so continuing, also wanted to show you guys this uh, Facebook page I found as well. 
It's called descendants of Nat Turner, literally. All right, again, these are real people. These are not created people by an act of Congress. These are actual real people. And they created this page, the person, you know, the main person, so he can be remembered. So his people, his ancestors could be remembered. I went through a lot of their information here, you know, most of it. Got to touch the hijack a little bit with the African, Pan-African stuff, the slave stuff. But at least they know who, that they are descendants. These are real people. And I found some good videos here. The person's family getting interviewed because he you can see the back and forth communication of the different descendants talking to each other about their ancestor and the different posts here. If you guys come to the page, you'll be able to read it yourselves. And if you're related, you might be able to find family in this website. They actually want people to get together and un unite to make the page bigger and everything. Wanted to read this real quick. It says, happy birthday to my beloved grandfather, Richard Archie Williams of Cortland, Virginia, July 18th, 1898. Real cousin of Nathaniel Turner. Pictured with my beloved grandmother, Annie Jo Ellsworth William. All right. And you see that? You see that Indian? <laughs> Again, real people, real genealogy. Here they got a post of the actual uh, cave that he hid in, Nat Turner, when they were looking for him. If not actually a cave, as he explains here, the cave that Reverend Turner used to evade capture was actually a depression on the earth created by a large fallen tree. The location has been preserved by our family. Again, real people, his family, his descendants. Wanted to show this post here. It says here, uh, thanks Shayna and Shelly for bringing him home. I believe uh, this is when they were reclaiming maybe or his body remains or something like that. Um, I clicked on the link, but this is from National Geographic, but it's no longer in their website. They took it down. But you can see uh, the picture. Again, remember the people associated with Nat Turner, a lot of Sharon Hoka indigenous not away blood all right and we got another post this here descendants of nat turner honored and gary it's from chicago tribune we saw them earlier right on a different article so here real quick we're going to show um what it appears to be malcolm x daughter interviewing descendants of nat turner again dodge the hijack with any you know black versus white you know slave narratives anything like that i know what they told us in school but the history that actually went down was much different. Hi, we are here in Boykin, Virginia. Um, we're at Blackhead Signpost. These are descendants of Nat Turner. And do you want to tell me what that sign represents? Uh, back in the days where uh, they had killed some of the blacks and they uh, took their heads off and hung them on uh, fence posts and along the way. Why, why did they do that? I'm not understanding. I think they was trying to, well, in rebellion to what Nat did. Oh, Nat kind of, Turner. Yeah, kind of sent him a message to him you okay. know, about all the killing that he was doing. So then they killed the blacks, you know. and Innocent then, people. Yeah. Okay. And cut their heads off and hung them on fence posts. That's right. They were black. They didn't make no difference yeah. on what they were. And then they took a name that rode after okay. that, after all this. Blackhead Signpost Road. What is it? Blackhead Signpost Road. Here we got another post says here, descendants of Nat Turner gather on the Southampton County farm where Turner hit during the 1831 rebellion. Brindle Hardy, Lemonty Hardy, Elois Pearson, Evelyn Hawkins, John Young, Jason Turner, Joyce Lewis, Yvonne Reeves, and Alvin Turner. Again, real people. He wasn't a fiction. All right, so now we're going to get um, Evelyn Hawkins uh, interview by Malcolm X's daughter about Nat Turner and her genealogy. All right, this is very interesting, and you're going to see how everything she says matches the tree we got. Well, I am really honored. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, Nat Turner and Denmark VC are two uh, heroes of mine as a child. The stories that we were told, my, my sisters and I, the stories that we were told about our history, about African-American history. And so... Um, it's such an opportunity to be here and, and record you um, from this dynamic bloodline. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me who she is? That's Corrine Turner. Turner. Corrine Turner Turner. Yeah. And how was she related to Nat Turner? 
She was said to be, uh, it's, it's, it's way back there. I want to tell you, I have a cousin mm -hmm. who could give you, she okay. lives in Capron, Vivian okay. Lucas. I don't have all that there on paper like she has. Okay. I'm more or less concentrated on the Musgrave side okay. because that's where his cave was located. However, this is her mother. Okay. That's Fanny Turner. They are the ones that are kin to Ned Turner. Okay. All right, all right. So real quick, guys. All right, so you just heard her, right? She said, Corrine. This is Corrine right here. Corrine and her mom, Fanny. She said, those are the ones that are related to Nat Turner somehow. Remember that Corrine's mom is Charlotte. Charlotte is the daughter of Nathaniel Turner or Nat Turner. Now, she did admit that she didn't really have it down, like she didn't know exactly how, but her cousin had it down. They had the whole line. She didn't really. She did mention she had the Musgrove line down. This is her mother. That's Fanny Turner. They are the ones that are kin to Nat Turner. Okay. Starting with when Nat was tang, uh, his family was dispersed. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, like I said, his wife and his daughter were sent down south where the worst of the worst plantations were. But anyway, his two sons, the one that she is supposed to be kin to, mm -hmm. causes kinship here, was John. I think now, I don't even know if that's his real name. Okay. It seems as if when his father was hanged, mm -hmm. he ran and lived with the Nottaway Indians down in the corner. He hid out all the Nottaway Indians. You know, there are a lot of black Indians mixed and all that, and they hid him down there. So again, Nottaway Indians, right? So-called black Indians. She's letting her know there's a lot of black Indians, right? Here you go. But the thing is, it's not that you were part Indian or that the, these African slaves were running away and hiding with Indians. You are the Indian. Now, she's mentioning all this stuff about the stories of them being split up and all that. You know, I've never been able to find any real sources to say exactly where they were sent, to who, all these kids, how many of them were. And now she's saying that they just sent through one of the sons who was John. And I remember that Charlotte Stiff was said to be married to John, who was her brother, which makes no sense. Either way, one of the parents, John or Charlotte, is the child of Nat Turner and Cherry. Either way, it still goes back to Indians. Remember, Nat Turner's mom is an Indian. So either way, they're coming from Nat Turner, who's coming from Nancy, who's coming from Edith. Let's continue. Grandmother Fanny, great grandmother Fanny was never a slave. Mm -hmm. She came from free people mm -hmm. and she came off of that reservation. Mm -hmm. that All right, so she just said her great grandmother Fanny, right here, was never a slave. She was born in 1858, all right, before slavery ended. She was never a slave and came from free people. Came from free people. And she was born in a reservation. Okay, she's an Indian, remember. James Turner was listed as an Indian under his dad, Edwin, too. These are all Indians. Now, she has a picture of Fanny right here, the little one here in the front. This is Corrine in the back. This is Elizabeth, Laura's mom. And this is Sydney Turner. She's going to let you know. Not a way reservation in Cortland. Mm -hmm. And that's the connection that we have to John Turner was through the years we have we found we know her mother's name was Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Charlotte uh we don't know exactly we don't have her background but if her daughter was on a uh not a way reservation evidently she was too. Right. And we're thinking that Charlotte was John's daughter. Mm -hmm. Our granddaughter. So now, what is the relationship between these two women? All right, so before we continue, she just mentioned Charlotte, right? Remember, Charlotte is the daughter of Nathaniel. Charlotte is supposed to be married to John, but she just said Charlotte 
she believes is John's daughter or granddaughter, not her husband. So see, there's a little confusion here with this part of the family. And I'm sure it's not their fault. I'm sure the authorities, all these people were trying to mix it up throughout the years and made it very confusing. But you see the names are being thrown out here. There is a memory, there is an oral tradition with these names. That's, this is her mother. Fanny oh, wow. is Corrine's mother. Okay, and she, they're both so beautiful. Okay, and they lived in Virginia? Oh yes, okay. Southampton County. Southampton mm -hmm. County. Okay, and tell me about these two. This is my grandfather, Sidney Turner, okay. who owns the land that, uh, where the cave is. Okay, and when you say the cave... I'm calling it the place where Nat Turner was captured because years ago, that's what people thought it was, mm -hmm. but it wasn't only it was, it was a hiding place that he could, a human being could have hidden under this tree that right. had fallen. He dug a hole there. And he stayed there for two months, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nearly two months, right. because he had other hiding places. <clears throat> but that was the last place where he was captured on our farm, where he stayed the longest. Mm -hmm. But it said that he, it seems as, like, as though his, his master died, Benjamin Turner. I think that was the one who owned him in the beginning. Okay. Some people think that was his father. That's why his skin color was not mm -hmm. black. Oh. All right, all right. So she just said a lot of people believe that was his father. She's talking about Benjamin Turner. This is her descendants. That's why he's light complexion. And then she was like, oh, remember he was described as bright. But that's not the reason. Remember, copper colored tribes of America, copper has many shades. So she was just pointing. So in the beginning, she was pointing out that the man in the picture, that's Sidney. Turner. Remember, Sidney Turner is Corrine's husband. These are the people I started the tree with, you know. And so going up from Sidney, we have again Laura and Richard Ellis, his dad. Laura Turner is his mom. He took his mom's last name. And her parents, again, John. Here goes to John Turner. There's also another John over here on this side, who's supposed to be the son of Nat Turner, too. So either way, again, either or. Is still going to go back to Nat Turner through Charlotte or her dad, Fanny's parents. So on Laura's side, she's going to talk about Elizabeth. And that's the picture she got right there in black and white, as you guys can see. Um, and so who is this beautiful woman right here? That's um, my great, great grandmother, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Turner mm -hmm. Wright. Stevens. Mm. Now, Elizabeth had children, three children by her master, which was George Musgrave. Mm. And they, uh... And when you say that she had three children by her master... Four or five, anyway. Oh. Four. So now she's saying that Elizabeth, right? Let me go back to the tree, guys. This Elizabeth right here, I'm going to show you guys that a lot of different families had her married to George Newitt Musgrave. Musgrave. That's who she's saying she had three or five kids with her slave master. We don't know if this was a so-called white man. But a lot of people had that. So this is what she was saying right now. So let's go back to it. She just said that. Many children. Did she have a relationship with him? Did they court The only another? relationship was she was a slave and he was a master. And he did all of this in the house with his wife and his other children, his white children. So that was the kind of relationship that was going on at that time mm -hmm. with Elizabeth. So with, I guess this would be, okay. Now I have a picture of Laura also, her daughter. Okay. It's in here, but Laura at that time was an older woman. This is Laura, that's her daughter. Oh, yeah. oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Wow. And this was my grandfather, the same guy, right? All right, so real quick, and that's here, right here, the lighter complexion person is the same person as over here, that's Sidney Turner. This is Laura. That's her daughter. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Wow. And this was my grandfather, the same guy right there. Your, okay. And there's a young man. And uh, Sydney, that's who he was. And of course, this is my Uncle Herbert Turner. Okay. And then there's Alvin. Alvin is 80 years old today. Wow. Mm -hmm. He's 80 years old. It's really wonderful that you've managed mm -hmm. to keep this collection, um, this family collection, because it's not easy to do. You well, know? Uh, see, my family was really close, and um, mm -hmm. my aunts had pictures, had these pictures in her house. Mm -hmm. My cousins had the pictures. All of us had the pictures. We just had them copied and, mm -hmm. and gave them to others throughout the family. So, so we left up earlier talking about, you know, the first descendant, Henry Turner. Um, now, what they're saying here is the person who brought in the Turner name, he was born in Brindle Carmel, Lancashire, England. He married an unknown Charon Hoka, Indian woman. Unknown, they say here, right? An Indian woman, right? Now, you know, this time, most likely she was a chief. She was born in 1603 in Surrey County, Virginia. So according to this book, Henry Turner Sr. and this unknown American Indian woman had the following children. They're saying Ann Turner, James Turner, Love Turner, Virginia Turner, and Thomas Turner. We go back to the tree, and I want to show you guys. I have Henry Turner right here, and I have Henry Turner Sr. And to Alvin, I just want to show you guys to Alvin, this would be his 11th great-grandfather. His wife, somebody put Marius for first name, is the Indian, as you see here. And of course, I don't have... Uh, her parents, just this, an Indian, born in 1590, and her brother, Apachanka. And as you guys can see, the children that they just named in the book, Ann Turner, James Love, Virginia, and Thomas. Here we have Virginia's husband, Tomlin. We got here through Virginia. You go down through Virginia, you reach John Turner and Mary Tomlin. Go down Mary Tomlin, you reach Thomas Turner and Martha Joyner. Go down Thomas Turner, you reach Thomas Turner the second and Mary Hicks. Go down the second, guess who you reach, guys? You reach Mary Turner, who was married to Thomas Woodson, who were the parents of Edith. All right, Edith, remember Edith? Nat Turner's grandmother. And that's how you get to Henry Turner. You saw how we did it? Again, Mary Turner, her parent Thomas Turner, and Mary Hicks. Remember, one of the Hicks was a living descendant. All right, so coming back to the book, again, you guys saw Henry Turner, and we got all the way to Nat Turner. All right, so again, these are his kids. We, they were in the tree. Right here says Thomas Turner was the servant of Captain Daniel Clark. That's an indenture. It says he even had a baby with a Negro woman. Evidence pointed out that he was the father of her child. <laughs> but he's an Indian, so, you know, couple of colored tribes, he is a so-called Negro, so, you know, that's the hijack. Then it goes over his kids' descendants, so his grandchildren and the next generations. It says here, tribal warriors of the Chiringhoka, not away Indian tribe, joined forces with Bacon, listen to this, in what became known as the infamous Nathaniel Bacon's Rebellion of May 1676, resulting in the downfall of the Okanichi Saponi Indians at Okanichi Island on the Roanoke River. Bacon's Rebellion was a catalyst to the Woodland Plantation Treaty of 1677, all right? Now, that's a deep one right there, and that's a future video. Of course, I'm going to follow up on that, all right? Iroquois Indians, right? Not away Indians, joined forces with Bacon and overpowering the Okanichi Saponi, aren't right? the Suwon people, the Saponi people, huh? Tribal warfare. Tona Torah, Tona Torah, Torah, you guys see that? Torah, Tona Torah. In the mid 1680s, the Chirunghaka, Norway Indian tribe, due encroachment by the colonials and to avoid war with other tribes, moved from Norway, town of Ofo, Tamahiton, and Suri. Then you got Tashorok town, which keeps coming up in the genealogy of the Turners, right? In 1711, colonial LT governor Alexander Spotswood met with the chief of chief men of the Chiron Hauka, Norway tribe of offering tribute, forgiveness, reference in the Treaty of 1677 
20 beaver pelts and three peace arrows. If the Chairman Hoka, Norway chiefman, would send their sons to the Brefferton, a school for Indians at the College of William and Mary, even though the Chairman Hoka, Norway, were fearful their sons would be sold into slavery, ethno-historic records document that Spots was reported on November 17, 1711, that two of the Chairman Hoka, Norway Indian chief's men's sons, were attending the Brefferton. Chairman Hoka and Norway Indian surnames continued to appear on the enrollment roster of the Brafferton throughout the 1750s and 1760s, all right, where they were getting the Indian out of you. Remember that all these Ivy League schools started out as Indian schools. All right, so continuing with the genealogy, it says here, uh, James Turner got with Janet Miller and had the following children, John Turner, who married Mary Tomlin. All right, real quick. Again, James E. Turner and Janet Miller, right? They just named them. Who had a son named John Turner, right? Who married Mary Tomlin, as you guys can see here. So James E. Turner from England. This is Alvin's 10th great-grandfather. So apart from the indigenous part, there's also the black European part, right? When we go down John Turner, again, we get to Thomas Turner. Remember, we already did this. And we end up with Nat Turner through Mary Turner, who is Edith's mom. All right, so we got all these people in the tree. John Turner Sr., who we just saw, was known as, again, King. Now, I wanted to show this. Uh, John Turner, chief man of the Chodin Kaka. This was Tom Sr.'s, Tom Turner Sr.'s dad. It says here, 1705, John Turner has spoken will by widow Mary Tomlin. Names sons John, James, William, Joseph, Simon, and granddaughter, Anne Everett. And we're talking about this John Turner right here. Husband of Mary Tomlin, right? They just said father of Thomas Turner. We're talking about, again, fourth, fifth great grandfather of Nat Turner. And he's a chief. Now, something important here before I go, it says sources. Indenture of Richard Kirby. Mentioning the chief men doing the indentureship. They had their own indenture apprentice program set up by lawyer Dennis McClendon, which answered the need to indenture native youth till the age of 21 in the British colonies. So was Nat Turner really a slave or was he just indentured? They self-indentured to keep their youth in their land for their apprenticeships. Okay, again, they were indenturing children until they were 21. Indigenous Indians, indigenous children. We got many cases of this. So when you hear stories about people being freed by their masters, were they really being freed or was their indenture over in reality? All right, here it mentions uh, Watt Bailey, Chief Watt Bailey, George Skipper, you know, familiar names, Eddie Turner. All right, as you guys can see, I just wanted to show you guys that. You got Thomas Turner Sr. here, one of the children that John Turner married Tomlin. He married Martha Joyner. Again, all these people are in the tree. Then we end up with the uh, Skipper family and the Skipper connection. But the earliest Skippers in the historical record in the Southern Colonies are John Skipper, William Skipper, Francis Skipper, and the above mentioned George Skipper. Their names are variously spelled Skipper, Skipper, or Skipper, 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 and even Supor. It says here George Skipper Sr. and Janet Turner had the following child, George Skipper Jr. Now we got a George Skipper who was born in Sharon Hoka tribal lands in 1698. All right. And it's saying his dad was John Francis Skipper Mangold or Mangue and Mary Ann Skipper or Ship. His wife, Mary Ann Bailey. Continue here. We have, uh, again, Thomas Turner Sr., known as Tom Turner, Cockaroos Tom or Cockaroos Tom, one for of Iroquois, Sharon Hoka, Indian. He was known by the title of Chief. All right. And he was married to Martha Joyner, it says here, Martha Joyner. And they had a son, Thomas Turner Jr., Thomas II. I want to show you the tree again. As you guys can see, we have Thomas Turner, who is the chief. Who they're trying to make <laughs> European. They got these emblems on here. But you can see one-fourth, though. Yeah, he is European, but he's also Indian. He's the chief. Martha Joyner, as you guys can see, they had Thomas Turner II, who is the father of Mary Turner, who is the mother of Thomas Woodson, who is Nat Turner's grandfather, and the husband of Edith, Nat Turner's grandmother, who was the queen or chief, right? Let's not forget that. So you guys see all the connections here. It's all in that book. 
up again, that's Mary Turner, right? Who was Thomas Woodson's mother, as it says here, daughter of Thomas Turner and Mary Hicks. She married Thomas Woodson Sr. So I just wanted to show you that that book, you know, the descendants of the Turners and the Sharon Hoka, Nottaway Indians uh, history. A lot of those people are in this family tree right here, as you guys saw. I wanted to come over back to uh, Marianne Bailey, who is George Skipper's wife. Marianne Bailey, again, is the mom of Mary Skipper, the wife of James Turner Jr. They are the parents of Edith, right? Now, going back up to Mary Ann Bailey, known Indian, right? As you guys can see, Nottaway tribe, a lot of people know. Her dad was Chieftain Walt Bailey. Walt Bailey, the eighth great-grandfather of Alvin Bailey, the person we started with. One thing I wanted to show you about him, now they're saying he's the chief in Indian, right? Part Indian. His dad is John Ansel, or Ansel Bailey. I want to show you guys something about Ansel, Ansel Bailey. He was born in England. So where the Indian is, still trying to find that. <laughs> but I know his dad was from England. Ansel Bailey, 1661, he came in. I'm going to show you guys something incredible I have here that matches the information from my other videos when it comes to indentured servitude. It's coming from Gloucestershire, and that's in Bristol. When I saw Bristol, that reminded me of a book I have, guys. Now, I have this book here, guys. You, I've shown it to you uh, before in my indentured servitude videos. Not many of you are going to remember. But this was a great, I, got, I have a hard copy, so I scanned this this morning just to uh, be able to put it in the video. Because I found something incredible here. It says here, the Bristol Racers of servants sent to the foreign plantations, right? Talking about slavery, so-called slavery, but they want to call it servants. These are slaves. They're going to an indenture, into the plantations all over the Caribbean, all over the North American colonies. From 1654 to 1686, this is by Peter Wilson Coldham. Now, real quick, I'm just going to read from the introduction here. It says here on September 29, 1654, the Council of the City of Bristol enacted an ordinance requiring that a system of enrollment be set up to record the names of all indentured servants embarking from the port of Bristol for service overseas. On the very next day, the first entry was penned in what was to become the register known as Servants to Foreign Plantations. The need for scrupulous tally arose from the longstanding and notorious practice of kidnapping and vagling and bribing youngsters onto ships bound for the labor-hungry colonies, kidnapping, just like they said they were kidnapping people from Africa, they were doing it in Europe. We've gone over this information. Make sure to check my previous videos. Dare to be sold at good profit, all right? People being kidnapped to be sold into slavery, into indentured servitude. Nor was the practice without way, weighty precedent for as early as 1619, the state had connived at the rounding up of vagrant children in London and their forcible shipment to Virginia. But when private enterprise adopted similar measures, the state took exception and prosecuted those responsible. Nevertheless, forcible shipment of servants, indentured or not, continued apace. An order of par Parliament of 9th May 1645 required officers and justices to exercise diligence in apprehending those responsible for the kidnapping and shipping of children. And the city fathers of Bristol may perhaps be considered negligent and having allowed nine years to pass before regulating these matters. All right, so basically they're explaining what happened. They created a log of all the people they were sending from Bristol, okay? And they were selling these people for money. Out of a total of just over 10,000 immigrants recorded in this book, all but a small handful were laborers, husbandmen, or tradesmen, most from the West Country, the West Midlands, and Wales, but with a fair sprinkling of intended immigrants from much further afield, including London, Cambridge, Lancashire, Scotland, Ireland, France, and even from the American colonies, even Indians or people from the American colonies themselves, while many undoubtedly arrived in Bristol having already indentured themselves to overseas service. All right, so that's what's in here. Now, believe it or not, guys, I actually found John Han Ansel right here, Ansel Bailey to John Driver for five years in Virginia. This is one of Nat Turner's ancestors. He was an indentured servant coming out of Bristol. Yes, he went into slavery as an indentured servant. And eventually these people got their freedom right after five years. And he probably got his own land, his own so-called slaves or indentures and things like that. But you guys can see recorded 1661, September 10th. All right, 1661, Ansel Bailey, John Ansel Bailey to John Driver for five years in Virginia. 
go back to Ancestry.com uh, for John Ansel Bailey, right? Coming out of Bristol. We're going to the gallery. We got a couple stories about him. We got his bio right here. I want to show you guys. Down at the bottom, it says the first listing of Anselm is that he sailed from Bristol to America. Ansel Bailey, indentured to John Driver, who paid his way five years. On September 10th, 1661, the Driver family were landholders in Gloucestershire and Bristol, not titled, but freemen of some position. The Drivers were related to at least one of the Bailey family. And this Bailey family, so it wasn't just like slave owners, right? They were related to them somehow. In this Bailey family, same pedigree as the one mentioned previously, the name Anselm the Pierce, on or before 26 October 1662 or even before 1657, a Giles driver immigrated to Virginia, Isle of White, and took up farming. Giles was a nephew of John Driver of Gloucestershire. Not surprisingly, in 1682, after Anselm would have served out his indenture, he bought land in Isle of White, suggesting he might have been living there. All right, and that's all we got. But I just wanted to show you guys all right, John Ansel, Alvin's ninth great grandfather, and Nat Turner's fourth great grandfather, John Ansel, came from England as an indentured servant from Bristol. And I have the register in that book I have bought. Okay. If you guys saw the rest of the people there, they were going to different places. If you look at the whole register, they were being sent to Jamaica, Barbados, all these so called Europeans, right? Oh, they're supposed to be white, but they weren't. I just wanted to show you guys that before uh, we left today. The genealogy is there. The history is recorded somehow. If you really search, if you really look, if you break out of those indoctrinations, all those lies of false narratives, the conjectures, the beliefs, you eventually see a more clear history. You see a true genealogy. You don't have to make up things. It's very clear what we see in here. We're talking about Europeans coming in mixing with the indigenous people of america both these groups eventually a lot of them being classified as colored people being grouped as so-called negroes being misclassified as white negro black again i hope you guys enjoyed this uh, presentation want to show you guys that nat turner was a real person he wasn't created by an act of congress please don't follow people blindly make sure you question everything even me you know, verify the sources. These are real people. Don't disrespect them. He had living descendants that had been fighting to be recognized for the story of their ancestor to never be forgotten. Whether the story of what happened that day is real or not, that's a whole different thing. And I believe something else happened. Who were these trustees? We're going to get into something. As you guys can see here, this is from JSTOR. It says here, determination and dispersal of the Nottoway Indians of Virginia. All right, future video we're going to get into. How convenient, right? It's so easy to create a fake story and say, oh yeah, he confessed all this, but yeah, you left out all his family. But there's a real genealogy. I hope you guys saw that. And most of the people in this street carrying this name, these surnames are found in this book, The Turn of Descendants of the Chairman Hoka, Not Away Indians by William Henson. All right, what a coincidence. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. It wasn't easy to put together. Some people may still not be convinced, but eventually you will see time will tell that the information presented here in general is accurate. Genealogy, a more true history of Nat Turner as a person. And when it comes to his ancestry, we're just talking about Nottoway Indians and possibly black Europeans, not Africans. So that's your own hijacks. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. Respect to the uh, Turner descendants that are living today. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Thanks for tuning in once again. Much love and respect. Hawaii.